can laugh, you can dance, you can stand up and sing along with us.
think that's the first time today that I smiled. You guys are great. You're awesome. Um, hi, everybody. I'm AJ. I sit right there. I'm the board executive officer. Our meeting is going to get started in just a minute. If you have a cell phone or a pager or any electronic device that makes noise, I'm going to ask you to please turn that so that it doesn't make noise. You can still get your alerts, but just let's turn the, uh, the noise off if we can. Uh, um, if you have something, if you're testifying tonight for the board and you have something to give to the board, please don't waste your time passing it around. Your time starts when you come up here. Hand it to me. I'll pass it around. And last thing, this little green light needs to be on in order for you to be recorded and heard out by the public out in the world. If that and hear you, so please, if I look at you, I wave and I say, please hit the button. It's just that little button right there. Otherwise, you don't need to touch it. All right, we're going to get started in just one second. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, our student performers from William Packa Elementary School, led by Mr. Michael Coberia, um, Kendall Chisholm, India Genius, Asha Freeland, Ariel Solis, Richard Floyd, Douglas Rodriguez, Corey Bowman, Faith Walker, Tyalia Gross, and Lasha Lindsay. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank our um, JROTC from Patterson High School um, under uh, command of Commander Lieutenant Colonel Alex Hunt, Cadet C Major Daniela Batista, Cadet Airman Basic Ashlyn Simmons, Cadet Airman Basic Baradine Mohammed, and Cadet Airman Basic Kais Albatena. Thank you very much for their uh, service tonight. James Harvey was a 12th grader at Claremont High School. James had a beautiful, beautiful soul. He will be greatly missed, and his passing had a profound impact on every single staff member and student at Claremont. 
James always stood out in a crowd because of his bright eyes, big smile, and infectious personality. James was a real people person. He loved to hear about your life, and his memory and recollection was incredible. If you told him a story about your family or pets or hobbies years ago, he could finally recall specific details and always wanted an update on things. Even when James was in a lot of pain, he would still manage to smile. His smile would light up a classroom. He willingly participated in class discussions, and he enjoyed having his nurse bring him up to the smart board to answer questions. James was a breath of fresh air and a ray of sunshine. He was a true inspiration, and he will forever be in our hearts and a part of the Claremont family. Alonzo Valencia Arzola was a 10th grader at National Academy Foundation. Alonzo was formerly a student at Highlandtown Elementary Middle School, number 237. The Highlandtown staff remembered Alonzo as a quiet student who was very close with his family. He was the big brother who looked out for his three younger siblings and who still attended Highlandtown. He had the cutest shy smile and, a, and loved a good game of soccer. Alfonso will be well remembered as a kind, gentle, and very helpful young man. He, he tutored and, and, fo and was focused on his studies and had, a, and had big dreams. He always had a kind word to say and would always offer to help with whatever might be going on in his school. After eighth grade graduation, Alfonso attended Digital Harbor High School and later transferred to the National Academy Foundation High School, where he was a student until his passing. Alfonso was an important part of the community in each school he attended. Staff at all schools loved him tremendously, and their hearts go out to his family. Alfonso will be deeply missed by all of the school communities. If we could take a moment of silence in remembrance. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the prior open session meeting minutes? Moved by Commissioner Canham, second by Commissioner Bondima. All in favor? Commissioners Pena. Bun uh, Berkeley, Hassan, High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, Vondima. Approved 10 to 0. I'd like to have a motion to approve the closed last prior closed session summary. All in motion by Commissioner High Cupboard, second by Commissioner Chinia. All in favor? Commissioner Berkeley, Hassan, High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, Vondima. 9-0 with one abstention. Um, we'd now like to have uh, reports from the board committees. I'd actually like to start with, um, since I have to pull up my ops, can we start with teaching and learning? Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to start with teaching and learning. Chair Ginia. <laughs> Good evening. It's a tongue twister, right? Yeah, it is. I'm just <laughs> probably going to say something else next time. <laughs> the Teaching and Learning Committee uh, met this morning. Um, we had a, a very robust discussion and presentation of um, the 2017 park scores um, and a review of um, what we've learned from them, uh, what that data is saying to us, and how, this, how um, our system is going to be working with uh, leaders, uh, teachers in the classroom in terms of, of helping our students in the areas that we have, um, have flagged. We also uh, we're, were very happy to hear that this analysis is not, was not just a one-time thing, but throughout this uh, year we'll be reviewing the analysis as we look at the things we've learned, the strategies that we're putting in place, and, and how things are, are working for students. We also um, had a presentation and a discussion around the school improvement grant and the priority schools. Uh, we had a, a, a initial description of what is happening in, in our uh, that um, set of four schools that are working together in the 100% the 
strategy. I want to make sure I say it correctly. Um, but these are schools that are working with the principal at Commodore John Rogers, which was a school that has really shown tremendous growth over the years from being a school that was in school improvement to moving out of that status. And so we're very hopeful that um, the strategies that were learned, the, the new um, innovations that may be tried this year will be things that we can look to see uh, replicating, um, sharing, duplicating across the system. And then we also looked at some uh, procurements that really uh, dealt with this whole area of uh, school improvement. Um, and some of those will be coming uh, this evening in terms of procurement. Our next meeting um, is uh, November the 28th. It will be in the boardroom and we will continue to look at data. We'll be looking at college and career readiness outcomes. We'll be looking at some baseline performance data and we will have a special education update. So we invite you to either come in person or if you want to tune in to be with us on November the 28th at 9 a.m. The Operations Committee met on October 17th. Um, we had a, I don't know, what's better than fabulous? We had a fabulous update presentation from um, a Food Services Director, uh, Liz Marchetta, and it was great because she brought a, a, a number of staff members from the Food, food Services um, Department, and so in, we invited uh, at least one of them up to speak to us because they they've continued to increase their operational efficiencies for the first time in a number of years um, that department actually ran a slight surplus uh, it's an enterprise operation so it has to pay for itself and so the numbers really looked terrific on that um, there's sort of an astounding increase in the uh, amount of fresh fruits and vegetables that are being served to our students. Um, I would encourage you, the full presentation is on the website. It, it was really, um, she put it in context for, for some um, national data and policy trends. So it was um, all the way around, it was a really good presentation. And we get that on a regular basis so that we can keep up with it. Um, but I can't emphasize enough the uh, uh, the efficiencies that have been introduced by that department, including taking a close look at the number of people who were uh, working part-time and full-time and the part-time people who weren't able to qualify for benefits uh, because of the number of the hours that, have, that were being worked. And so they've been able to really uh, redeploy, uh, take a look at the operation and where s staffing could be changed. And so we actually have more people working full time who now qualify for benefits. And these are people that are, have kids in schools and are in our neighborhoods. And so that, that kind of improvement reverberates through our community. So it was an important part of the presentation. Um, we, we also had a number of procurement items that we talked about. One is on the agenda for tonight, the um, uh, funds for the uh, Marie Faring the purchase of the a building that uh, currently houses Chesapeake Center for Youth Development, um, which is a tremendous opportunity for city schools to help with the overcrowding at Marie Faring. Um, it's just important to note that, that that request for purchase is contingent on this completion of a successful feasibility study. Um, we also had a We've been bringing up a number of times, uh, there's a couple of items that have come up a number of times that the, that the Operations Committee has um, been discussing. We, we see procurement items for contractors who help us with um, minor repairs, and it's one thing to have minor repairs just because things have wear and tear and you need to repair them. It's another thing to have to continually repair things because of vandalism, and we're seeing a repeated number of those kinds of items. And um, as we've said um, to Blaine, uh, you know, we really hope that you can collaborate with the um, Family and Community Engagement Department so that we can think about how we might have some community meetings, community conversations to find out what else is going on there because we really don't want to leave it to the facilities department alone to just continually make these repairs. Chances are that, that the young, they're not necessarily young people who are doing the vandalism, but somebody's trying to tell us something. and. Uh, Yes, we'll keep repairing the buildings for our students, but we'd really like to dig a little bit deeper into, uh, into some of those issues. And we were glad to know that they have uh, started those conversations. And we look, when we have, when there's more to report on that, we'd actually like to have some conversations at the board meeting level. Um, the other issue that we keep bringing up, um, we added up the total of the contracts that we were approving at the 
last meeting on the 17th, um, and it was, they were all up to contracts because you're, you're, you're trying to put in place vendor contracts to help with plumbing and roofing and door repair, et cetera. And the estimated annual amount for those contracts was $7.14 million. And once again, we raised with them that it would be really nice to know how we can start to connect those contractors who are getting millions of dollars in business from the school system to our core business, which is education. So for example, are those people offering internships? Are they offering apprenticeship programs? What are we doing to connect those contracts to the core business of the system? And uh, once again, we were thrilled to learn from both Jeffrey Parker and um, Blaine Lipsky um, that they have started those conversations. So we look forward to hearing uh, a more detailed update on that from them. But we've raised it a number of times they're beginning to work on that and uh, we were really glad to know that because even though it's you know necessary contracts to keep our facilities up to date we think everybody who's involved with the business from the district should somehow be attached to our core business and that was anything who else it was just me and Michelle is there anything you want to add we had a brief discussion about um, the changes they're going to make with the materials as far as um, the um, styrofoam cups oh yeah and looking at the environment and 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 chemicals such as benzene and how it affects um, health and everything and they talked about the changes they they're making so we were really really pleased with the, that conversation so. yeah I omitted that from the food and food mm -hmm. services they are going to be eliminating the styrofoam trays mm -hmm. we had a good discussion about benzene right mm -hmm. that's it so a policy committee yeah, I'm going to report since Commissioner Hassan was Hassan James wasn't able to make it that day. Um, first off, I want to congratulate Commissioner Hassan James on being elected as Policy Committee Chair. Oh, While she wasn't there, <laughs> the board elected her as Policy Committee Chair. Um, yeah. It's same thing it was, happened to Commissioner Chinia. Chinia like, so yeah. Apparently, don't show up at your vote meetings. That's right, and it was unanimous. Okay. So you, you should know that Muriel, Michelle, and I all voted for you. Um, so we covered two uh, policies at the meeting. We covered these DBC, the Annual Operating Budget Development and Adoption Revision Funding Model Review. It literally is sort of putting us on a calendar, an annual review of budget and how we do our funding model. Um, there were questions around stakeholder engagement and when staff has been asked to go back and sort of reach out to the unions because one union was brought up in particular and we said if you're going to reach out to one, you should reach out to all so the union stakeholder engagement will be uh, added to that next presentation. Um, the, pre the presentation of PCAB for this is scheduled for November 7th. Um, we also had policy JRA, the maintenance and release of student records, um, which sounds like a boring topic, but yet was highly engaging um, because we have so many paper student records across the district. And so we spent a lot of time talking about sort of where they're housed and if schools are closed, where do the records go? And that there's this three year plan currently underway with staff to sort of, to, um, uh, what's it called? Electronic, put it all in some kind digitize. of digitize. Thank you, digitize. Thank you. <laughs> My words are escaping me. Digitize the records. And so it's going to take a long time, but there's sort of a plan and action to do that. And that's what that policy was about, is sort of conversing, converting those and getting those to where they need to be. So that was fantastic. Um, we also had a deep discussion from public comment. Um, several students came to testify about the, uh, um, sexual harassment policy, um, specifically students who were concerned about the need to have a separate transgender student policy. A um, couple great points were mentioned, one being that all transgender issues do not have to deal with harassment, that they're also about student rights, and so that's something we need to take into consideration because we were talking about literally just adding additional uh, protections, if you will, and the harassment policy for transgender students. Um, and we're, we're waiting a case right now in Frederick County where, where Frederick actually did a policy on this very issue, and there's a lawsuit against it right now. And so our, our legal team and folks and the board sort of talk through what options could we do right now in the short term, given that that case is being considered, to think about protections for transgender students in the immediate. Um, and so we are at, um, we had a second review of policy at the board meeting, we postponed it. We are now on third review. That, I don't know what the date. Do you know the date of that review? Actually, it should be November. The November fourteenth board. Fourteenth meeting. board meeting. Okay. So we'll we'll take that up for consideration. Then there's still room for comment if folks want to give comment about what should be included in this current policy, what might be considered in a future date for a separate policy for protections for those students. So it was, it was a great discussion. We had parental uh, uh, testimony, we had student testimony, we had teacher testimony. And I really appreciate those folks coming out during the policy meeting to sort of uh, share that with us. So I think that's all. Did I miss anything, Michelle or Mary? Would you like to add anything? 
Okay, good. Just that policy with the the, the uh, adjustments that are being made to it are going to be heard at the next PCAB meeting. I don't have the date in front of me right now. November 7th. But at that meeting, that Trish it will be presented. That we got a big no from Trish. You, you'll November, oh, November November 2nd. 2nd. Thank you, Trish. Garcia Bill. Okay, that's it for me. Mm -hmm. So the last time we were together, um, numerous people, including Trish and Kim, you know, and, and others, implored everybody go to the Kerwin Commission hearing on the 12th. Go to the Kerwin Commission hearing on the 12th. Well, apparently everybody heard them um, because everybody showed up uh, at the Kerwin Commission hearing on the 12th. It was Baltimore uh, put its uh, a very strong foot forward uh, on the tw on October 12th. Um, we had a lot of people in the auditorium. Uh, applause in unison. Uh, I knew I was going to stay for the whole evening. I was, you know, I brought my cell phone with me so I could like keep up with my email in case I got bored. Well, I got to tell you, 60 people spoke. Not one single person veered off topic. They were strong, passionate, on point. We really showed up well. I think they were kind of blown away. They were actually paying, they were really paying attention. You know how you can kind of tell when somebody's not paying attention? They were paying attention. We got a lot of positive comments from them afterwards. We heard that there was about 20 people showing up at the public test, the, these public hearings in other districts. I don't know how many people we had there, but like we had multiples, multiples of 20. It was a really, really strong showing. And um, this is just the first volley in what we're going to need to do as a community to make sure that they not only heard our clear, strong testimony, um, but they, they act on it. And you can be sure that between us and the advocacy community, and I'm sure Trish and Kim will be getting people or organized to when, when it's time to be in Annapolis and continue to carry that message. But I really, on the behalf of the board, want to thank everybody for being there in unison and putting our Baltimore's best foot forward. So thank you very much. And that's my chair comments. Um, and I have uh, there are no gifts and donations to report uh, between October 4th and October 17th. I guess the gift was that everybody showed up on October 12th. Um, I need a motion to approve the PEP agenda and the appeals and hearings for quasi-judicial matters. So moved. Motion by Commissioner High Cupboard. Second. Second by Commissioner Hassan. All in favor? Commissioner Berkeley, Hassan. High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, Bondima. Uh, vote is nine with one abstention. I'd now like to turn it over to Dr. Santalisis for CEO comments. Thank you very much, Commissioner Kashani. Um, <clears throat> and Commissioner Kashani basically took um, the first part of my comments, which Sorry. was just to, no. I, it's, we didn't check our notes. No, it's fine. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, but I will just add my thank you to everyone who poured in uh, for the Kerwin Commission um, testimony. <clears throat> I will just um, add a special thank you. Um, Really, to the young people, we had a number of young people who came out that night um, to speak. Um, and for me, and I think everybody there, uh, one of the most powerful pieces that the that the members of the commission noted was the wide span um, of the community that was represented. And uh, the student voice, I would say, was some of the most powerful voice of the evening. Um, and I think we found out what Poly Auditorium, when packed, um, what is about, how many, was it about a thousand people? How many does Poly Auditorium hold? Auditorium holds a thousand. So, so Poly Auditorium holds about a thousand people. And I would say at one point in the evening when I turned around, um, and I was on the front row, so it was hard to do the whole night. But at one point, we had just about every seat filled. Um, so I think that's an important to note as well. And, and I will just add a big thank you. I, you know. You, nothing is more encouraging than seeing um, a community come out and advocate um, on behalf of its young people. So thank you again, and I'll just add that thank you, um, too. The other piece um, that I would like to do is <clears throat> is um, kind of publicly take some time in my comments to piggyback off of um, some wonderful news that um, has been a story, I think, that has grown into national recognition. And it really is, I don't know how many people have had the chance, if you haven't already had the chance, 
um, to hear about the wonderful events at, at uh, City Springs Elementary Middle School. Um, we want to make sure that we recognize them tonight. And I think what is, what's really impressive, um, and I will just say, uh, Principal uh, Raketa texted the link um, that day, and I remember it was, it was kind of a crazy day when I got that link, and I clicked on it in the car and just went, this is why we do the work. Um, and it was definitely the highlight um, of the day and the week. And I think what's so inspiring, uh, one, is that um, young people in Baltimore City had a living example of what happens when students, t a caring teacher, um, mobilize on behalf of others um, first. And I think what is so wonderful about it is that these were young people and a teacher who mobilized, not expecting to get anything in return. And I remember one of the things my grandmother used to tell me when I was growing up is you don't do good because you think everybody's watching. Mm -hmm. You do good because it's the right thing to do. And then every once in a while, God gifts you with somebody who notices, and it blows up into something much bigger than you initially intended. And I think that the community at City Springs Elementary, the young people that are here tonight, um, and their appearance uh, of, of Mr. Wyatt um, Oroke. Did I pronounce your name right? Yes. Thank goodness. Um, <clears throat> and four eighth grade students we have here tonight from City Springs. Um, Tajma Burnside, Chantel Thomas, Terrence Douglas, Dakara Fleet. Did I pronounce everybody's name right? Kinda. If I, if I didn't correct me. It's Chantel. Sorry about that, Chantel. Thank you for the assistance, my dear. Um, and uh, their, their principal, Rhonda Raketa, um, are all here. We also have um, with us um, from the operators who are here as well. Um, but I just want to thank you all. Um, it is an incredibly an inspiring story. I'm going to invite them up now to the table to share that story. Um, and again, the fact that what they set out to do for other people um, was noticed, noted, and inspired people across the country. And they, had, they also had just the minor little detail of uh, being able to go on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Um, and so um, I, I want, I, and by the way, I want you to know um, that it was very encouraging, uh, Mr. O'Rourke, to see somebody who, who teared as much on national television as I would like to think that I would have as well. You, your passion for your young people and their passion for you um, was palpable. So thank you for your representation of city schools, all that is best about our city. Um, and I want to invite you and the young people to come and really talk about um, what you all did. So can you come to the front? And you know what, my apologies, because we should have had the clip. Had I, had I thought ahead, we would have had the clip, because it's a one. I, and you're like, no, that's fine, thank you. <laughs> it we saw it. Clip. I just want everybody else to yeah, see it. I, it. <laughs> I recorded you. It's very cute. Good evening, Dr. Santalesis and commissioners. My name is Tajma Burnside, and I've been attending City Springs Elementary Middle School since kindergarten, and now I'm in the eighth grade. Good evening, Dr. Santelisis and commissioners. My name is Dakira Fleet, and I'm an eighth grader at City Springs Elementary Middle School, and I've been attending City Springs since pre-K. Good evening, Dr. Santelisis. My name is Chantel Thomas. Um, I attended City Springs since seventh grade, so this is my first year. Um, thank you. Good evening, um, Dr. Tessa Lisa, the commissioners. My name is Terrence Douglas, and I am an eighth grade, eighth, eighth, eighth grade scholar at City Springs Elementary Slash Middle School, and I've been attending um, City Springs Elementary Slash Middle School since pre K. Thank you. I would like to share with you a few facts I've learned about Hurricane Harvey, about Hurricane Harvey in Houston. Texas is the second largest state in America. And when Hurricane Harvey hit so viciously, it negatively impacted a lot of people's lives. The geography in, the geography in Houston is mostly flatlands and concrete. So, and concrete is impermeable. 
and that means to not let fluid pass through. So when the levee broke, it was nowhere for the water to go or drain out. My classmates and I decided to um, raise money for Houston because they didn't have the materials or the um, resources that they needed to survive, and we just felt very sympathetic. Our original goal was $500, but so many people were inspired by our story that they decided to donate to inside and outside of City Springs, and we ended up with $3,000. The best part about this project was that it was student-led because we got to make all the decisions. We got to pass out the brochures, we got to put up posters, and we got to um, co collect the money. And teachers, they didn't need to do all of this because we volunteered to do this all by ourselves because we wanted to show leadership and be resilient. We did this because we can wake up in the morning every day and we can go to our refrigerator and get something to eat, but they can't because they're living in shelters because their phone because their homes were destroyed. So we wanted to show one of our attributes here at, at City Springs, which is empathy and we really really prize that one the most, I think, because we've all been through our own situations. Thank you. Um we got a lot of um great feedback um, from doing this great cause for um, her, um, for Houston while the Hurricane Harvey um, situation has happened. Um, one of the first, I mean, some of the some of the feedback we have gotten is the some of the news stations had came to our class to support us, and news stations like WBAL, WJZ, Fox 45, which came to us going viral on the internet, um, specifically Twitter. Um, we um, they had posted about us, and the internet went wild. Um, when we first found out, we had 150,000 retweets, which had got Ellen's attention, and she wanted to um, recognize us by what we were doing for Houston. She thought it was a great cause. So for a reward for us that we didn't know, like, the day she gave it to us, um, she gave us $25,000 for the school, and we appreciate it a lot. Wait, I'm sorry. How much? 25000 There you go. <laughs> turn it around. Turn it around. Um, so feedback for us for um, personally, um, Tajma, she has been reached out by UCLA, and she is being sent like materials and things like that. Daycare has been recognized by construction companies, and Chantel, she has been recognized by the SPCA, and she just um, had a meeting, and she's going to be doing volunteering works um, soon. And I, I I've been recognized by CBS, and they're they're going to be sending me some materials and showing me like showing me like different tactics of video editing and things like that. So we want also we want to thank you, Mr. O, for exposing this problem to us because without him we probably wouldn't have thought about this um pro I mean cause. And it definitely means a lot to us. Thank you. Just real quick. A week and a half ago I had the honor of sitting next to Ellen DeGeneres on stage and found out just minutes before I walked out there. And that didn't even come close to the honor of standing in front of our kids every day. I have, I'm going to get emotional here. Um, okay. <laughs> I have 120 of the most amazing children in Baltimore City and in the entire world that I get to stand in front of every single day. And I don't take that for granted. I am so blessed to have been able to, on national TV, not just represent our 700 children, but every staff member that works at City Springs. It, it wasn't just me sitting up there. It was everyone that has been hired through, our, through Baltimore City Public Schools, through our amazing charter, Baltimore Curriculum Project. And none of the work that these students have done since pre-K could have happened without our amazing staff members. And so I just also want to acknowledge that while it's great that so many people have said, Ms. Joey did so well, what's better is that so many people have acknowledged how amazing the students are and every single staff member that has worked with our students from pre-K to eighth grade every single day. So I want to thank all of the staff members at our school for just how amazing they have been with our kids. So thank you.
like to um thank you for um inviting us here and being able to recognize the cause that we have done for um supporting others and showing empathy for others that we not just know but think people all around the world. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you. And can I just um can I just say uh, one last time that you all already are absolutely amazing leaders. And just the way that you've presented yourselves, the way that you communicate on, on, on your own behalf, but behalf, the behalf of others, um, is absolutely um, why we all come to meetings like this. Thank you for reminding us of that. I do want to say, um, again, to the high, high quality work of the staff at City Springs under the leadership of Rhonda Raquetta, Laura Doherty, John McGill at Baltimore Curriculum Project. Thank you um, for giving us these kinds of stories. It is so um, wonderful. The only way to counter the narrative that other folks want to fixate on, which is not the majority of our kids, is by continuing to see you all lead from your seats. And it, you know what's so funny is I tell folks who work here at city schools to make sure they lead from their seats, meaning whatever you do, be a leader in whatever you do. And you all exemplify that um, in ways that some of the adults I work with um, can only aspire to. So I appreciate it and thank you very much. Yes, AJ. Do we want a picture? Is that what you're saying? Well, you know, they took a picture with Ellen, so I'm sure they don't want to take a picture with me. But come on, let's take a picture. We want a picture with them. They're famous. Yeah, that's true. That's a really good point. So shall we get a picture? Sure. Yes. Let's go. And you're, you want to be part of this picture? You were, yeah, I think so. Mr. Alt needs to be in the picture too. Mr. Alt needs to be in the picture. And on that high note, I end CEO's comments for this evening. Okay. We're going to do a review of the consent agenda. Do you have any new hires to introduce? Oh, sorry Thank about you. that. Yeah, I do. We do have new hires. Yeah. That's why they always tell me to do the PEP first. <laughs> so if I could invite our chief human capital officer um, on board to help me with the PEP for this evening, I would appreciate it. Mr. Grant Skiller. Good evening, Commissioners. Dr. Santelices. We have five appointments this evening. First, uh, Sarah Bollard, currently coordinating teacher for the Judy Center at John River Elementary Middle School, is appointed coordinator of the, for Judy Centers in the Office of Early Childhood Education, effective October 30th. Alicia Good, currently Educational Associate at Frederick Elementary, is appointed Educational Specialist 2 for Guidance, effective October 30th. <laughs> Veronica Grimes, currently Educational Associate at Forest Park High School, is appointed Educational Specialist 2 for Guidance, um, effective October 30th. Sarah Heaton, currently Managing Director of District Policy for the National Council on Teacher Quality, is appointed Director of Strategy and Continuous Improvement, effective November 13th. 
And Anthony Pena, currently Educational Associate at Booker T. Washington Middle School, is appointed Student Support Liaison, effective October 30th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grant Skinner. Now that concludes my statements. All right, so we're going to um, walk through items on the consent agenda. And for any items that you'd like to pull for discussion later in the meeting uh, in questions, We'll pull them. Um, first item, 8.01, Baltimore Teachers Union contract. Second item, 9.01, Chesapeake Center for Youth Development. Item 10.01, Multiple Vendors, Supplemental Instructional Materials. Item 10.02, Judy Centers, uh, I actually have a question about that item. Um, it just wasn't clear to me. Um, it says the purpose of the amendment is to replace the vendor. It wasn't clear to me from what I read um, if the vendor who had been in place had already started the work and is it typical that you replace a vendor after a contract's been approved. It just wasn't clear to me. Um, and I also went, I, so I do have that I'm sorry, fairly straight. I wasn't in the Teaching and Learning Committee, so I don't have access to that information. Um, and also, um, when it does come up for vote, uh, because I work for the Baltimore Community Foundation, I would like to recuse myself on that vote. Um, next, 10.03, Academic and Enrichment Programs, Extended Learning Services. Could we pull that, please? Um, can you say a few words? Sure, it's the same thing I'm going to say about 10.04, 05, and 06 is I'd like to see how it's going to fit into our overall arts strategy and ensure that it's not going to, it's going to supplement and not supplant arts education in the schools. Well, that's convenient because I had exactly the same question. I was only going to ask it about 10 point, um, I, I zero did six, but I think it's zero one because it's yeah, less no, explanation it's of what's fair, included in there fair. and how that fits in the overall insurance that we're meeting our blueprint. Of so power. in fact, we will pull 10.03, 10.04, 10.05, and 10.06, and then when we get to that part of the agenda, we'll sort out um, how we want to ask the questions and whether we want to vote them all at the same time. 11.01, SAS Institute. 13.01, Morton Salt, Inc. No, it's not table salt. 13.02, Shaw Sports Turf. 13.03, Motor Coach Bus Transportation Services. 13.04, T-Mobile Northeast LLC. 13.05, T-Mobile Northeast LLC. 13.06, Sparks Quality Fence Company. 13.07, Coloss Colossal Contractors, Inc. and Tito Contractors, Inc. 13.08, Colossal Contractors, Inc. and Tito Contractors, Inc. 13.09, Alliance Exterior Construction, Inc., Simpson of Maryland, Inc. and Coal Roofing Company, Inc. 13.10, P. Flanagan and Sons, Inc., and American Tennis Courts, Inc. 13.01, G.E. Tignell and Company, Inc., Denver Ellick, Inc., BMC Services, LLC, J.F. Fisher, Inc., and the Pool and Kent Corporation doing business as MCOR Services. Just as a correction, it's 13.11. Sorry. Okay, so we are going to pull items 10.02, 10.03, 10.04, 10.05, 10.06. .06. Can I have a vote, a motion to approve? No. Never mind. We're going to hear from the public first. Never mind. Yes, ma'am. Scratch that. Okay. Um, backwards. All 
I would now like to, um, are there any special recognitions? I think we already did that. Um, now I'd like to uh, invite some of our special guests before we open up for general public comment. Uh, first up is Trish Garcia Pilla from Parent Community Advisory Board. Hi, good evening, commissioners and Dr. Sanalesis and other administrators. Uh, very quickly, um, I wanted to just make that quick correction. November 2nd is our public meeting at 7 o'clock in this room. It is not a regularly scheduled meeting. And we will be meeting here in order for the public to have the opportunity to go over the draft of the JBB uh, with um, Mr. Clarence Parker and the EEO office. Uh, so that is not, you will not find that meeting on our page on the website because it is a specially scheduled meeting, uh, but you can find the flyer for it on our Facebook page. It is posted there. Um, and I, I will be getting with communications this week and trying to get the flyer on the PCAB page. So if you go there, it will be there hopefully in the next couple days. So that's next Thursday, I believe. Yes, but we have um, planned our working meeting ahead of that. So that's what um, Commissioner Hike Hubbard was talking about and the budget stuff that we'll be, we'll be working on that in our working meeting prior to the public portion of the meeting that's here at 7 o'clock. So that's what's happening with PCAB. Our next public meeting that's scheduled is November 16th will be in this room. Thank you. Great. And thanks for all your help with the Kerwin thanks. meeting. Yes. Next, Peggy Gladden from the BTU. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening. Hi. CEO. Hi. I'm Peggy Gladden from the Baltimore Teachers Union, a field representative here to um, represent Ms. Marietta English, our president. The BTU just completed its 35th annual quality and educational standards in teaching, better known as Quest. The conference was held on Friday, October the 20th. It was a day filled with dynamic speakers, including Mayor Pugh, State's Attorney Mosby, our Chief of Schools, John Davis. We had a keynote speaker, Robert Jackson. We also had a commissioner present, Ms. Chinya. I saw her in the um, convention center. We had a host of workshop presenters, and we had over 700 educators attending this year's Quest training. The BTU is preparing to support the National Day of Action for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival, Arrivals, better known as DACA, on Thursday, November the 9th. This will mark two months without the legislation under the current Trump administration. The BTU is very hopeful that the remaining teachers and paraprofessionals who were laid off in June will be reassigned to classrooms in Baltimore City. We know that many of our principals have had to fill vacant positions in their schools with substitute teachers. And as a result, our children are not getting the full educational experience they deserve. It is our hope that the qualified teachers and paraprofessionals who were laid off in June will be assigned to fill those vacant positions so that we can ensure that our children are being taught by professionals who have the ability to equip our children for academic success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'd like to invite Ms. Deborah Demery, President of the PT Council of Baltimore City. 
PTA Council of Baltimore City, I'm sorry. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. PTA is the largest and the oldest advocacy group in the nation. Its mission is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families to advocate on behalf of all children. We would like to recognize PTA President Tamika Suber, the principal, principal Patak, and the dedicated teachers, staff, and families of Henderson Hopkins Partnership School. PTA works with administration and families work together as equal partners. It is not the function of the PTA to supplement the school budget, pay salaries, or purchase equipment. PTAs are 501c3s with bank accounts that must remain separate from the school. Money for schools comes from government entities and is considered public money. PTA funds are considered private. How PTAs spend their money is decided by their general membership. Members should never be subjected to threats and intimidation because they choose to follow the rules. October is National Bullying Prevention, Prevention Month. Research shows that one of the most effective ways to prevent bullying behavior is to create a positive school climate. School climate encompasses everything that contributes to a student's experience with school, the physical building, policies, staff, and peers. When we think of bullying, we associate it with students, but our families don't like to be bullied either. There should be mutual respect. Remember, we don't want to volunteer, we want to be engaged. On a lighter note, tomorrow night we kick off Reflections, a national PTA program that showcases the artistic talents of our students. Please join us tomorrow night at 6.30 in room 301. We have presentations from Jill Warzer, the Baltimore, Edu the Baltimore Arts Education Initiative, and Joanna P. Sunyer, I know I butchered that name, Green Schools Coordinator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Appreciate that. We have other um, recognized groups uh, who have not it, had any advanced sign up, so I just want to confirm that nobody's here to speak for them. Um, AFSME, Pizzazza, CUB, Associated Student Congress of Baltimore City, and CCAC. Okay. Um, we have uh, three people signed up to talk to us for general public comment. First up, uh, Sekou Kasimo. <coughs> Madam Chair, Dr. Sanford, Research Commissioners, I promise I'm not going to talk about guns tonight. But I'm going to talk about it. Better? I'm going to talk about this policy on discipline, which does not appear to be working because we have more altercations, more confrontations now than we had last year. I think we might want to revisit the old policy because this liberal policy uh, basically smacking students on their hands. They're not getting the message. And unlike a lot of folks who focus on the disruptive elements, I focus on the ones who come to school and do the right thing, who are obedient. The ones who disrupt the classrooms and the learning environment need to be held accountable. They need to be punished. And I'm telling you because I know I used to be one of them in junior high school. They don't respect slaps on the wrist. They think that's like a license to do whatever they want to do. Now, this incident at North and Charles on the bus is a good example. And it's, on, it's usually only a handful. I volunteered at Matthew Henson Elementary School in Renaissance. So I have a little experience with what goes on in the schools and the classrooms. And just about in every school, it's just a handful. But then that's all it takes to start it. And then others will join in. If you punish the ringleaders, the ones who are constantly in trouble and giving folks a problem, then the rest of them are going to get in line. And one of the things you can do about the bus situation, if you suspend those free riding privileges and those parents have to buy bus passes that cost $4.20 every day, after a week or two of that, 
I guarantee you those parents will get those children under control. In addition to that, those backpacks, which routinely cause a lot of confusion because they get on the bus with them on their back, the aisles are not that wide, and a lot of them do it intentionally. they instigators, they troublemakers, that's what they do. They live for it. I ride the bus all the time. Even though you see me on my bicycle, that's just to get me to the bus stop, which is like seven blocks from my house. All right, but I'll be on the bus all the time. And these children routinely use those backpacks to create a problem. They'll turn around intensely and hit somebody that's sitting down. And that's what happened the other day, yesterday, right down there north in uh, Child Street. So in conclusion, we really should consider revisiting that new policy because it's not working. It's getting worse. And I heard on the news today suspensions are down. They need to be up. Thanks, Seku. Next, we welcome Kim Truhart. Good evening. Three minutes is not enough. Okay. Um, two T-Mobile contracts. I generally write an objection to those contracts principally because I'm very concerned about the health and welfare of our children and the unknowns that exist around that technology. And um, for a while, no new contracts were awarded, but I see we're back in business. And I appreciate the fact that you're going to get $42,000 per site. Um, from the vendors, um, I don't think it's enough to compensate the potential damages that are being done to our children um, by putting cell antennas on top of our buildings. Um, our legislators have not done their job in protecting our children, and my expectation is this board will, and it hasn't, and that is so disappointing. Um, Kerwin. Kerwin was very good. And the theme that I heard consistently that evening was concentrated poverty and how do we address that. And we need to have conversations here around that issue and the equity that goes along um, or inequities. Um, I'm very concerned about our third graders who are being forced to take the park assessment and some of them have not had practical hands-on experience with computers. And I've been, not very loudly, but trying to promote a conversation around that, that how outrageously onerous is it to make a child in the third grade sit down at a computer and take a reading and math assessment exam and they don't even know how to manipulate the keyboard. I think it's unfair. I think it's outrageous. We've got schools in this district that don't have computers. And in the interest of transparency, I think you need to tell us which schools don't have computers. And for those children who are being forced to take this assessment exam, if they have not had at least 25 hours of practical hands-on experience on a keyboard, they ought to be exempt because we have failed them. And this cannot continue. It shall not continue. You need to engage parents in a different kind of way and you haven't done that well. I think that our community engagement practice <laughs> sucks around here. And so it needs to be beefed up in a real meaningful way to help parents prepare their children. Can't be all your shoulders, on your shoulders completely. But you've got to understand that some of our poor families don't have the wherewithal to prep their children without external support. 
So I have a question um, in response to something she said. I, I'm not sure who to direct this to, so I'll look at Allison since that's what I usually do when I have a question. Um, is there some um, systematic way that we have of making sure that third graders are exposed to computers before we ask them to take park exams? I, I, I don't really know. So, Can so I tell you what my teachers are doing at Liberty? Yes. They sent a resource list to the families and told them there is a typing tutorial free on Khan Academy. Okay. Sounds nice, right? But, but that doesn't work in a very low income community where folks don't really understand what that means. Khan Academy is a great online tool, right? Um, but, but it ain't working. You can't just throw a list over the fence and tell parents, sign your kids up for Khan Academy typing tutorial. Come on. So I, just, I guess I asked the general question, and it might be it might be something for follow up. But it, it's a I don't want to presume I, we can actually. I, I would actually, with your permission, Chair Kashani, I think one that the CAO has some <clears throat> excuse me some insight to weigh in on, and then I think in line with the question that was just asked. Um, we're able to provide the board with an overview of where schools are in terms of actually having computers. I think, though, to get to the heart of Ms. Truehart's question, which is um, about young people, about students' actual time on computers and how they're using them, I think that that's, that's a deeper question. Um, and that's a question that's not just a simple data spreadsheet. Yeah. We can talk about expectation, and I'm sure um, I'll, I'll go out on a limb if she disagrees with me. I'm sure she will let, let me know. But I think even Ms. Trueheart can appreciate the fact that while there might be policies and guidance, the actual getting down into classrooms and making sure it's happening every day, um, we, we, still, we still have work to do on that. But, but I do think, um, again, I'd like the CAO to just talk a little bit about where we are with the use of technology. Yeah, parts, parts of your question we'd have to go back and get you the specific answers for, but our principals in our schools are able to hire, uh, or most of, many of our schools have computer labs. So I was at a school visit today they have a computer lab, they have a tech teacher, and many of those uh, tech teachers or contractors, you know, students are on the computer and doing different various programs. Uh, some schools are doing coding, some schools are just on there doing interventions, but we'd have to get you the specific information on exactly what they're doing and how long that they're on the computer. Yeah, yeah. The, the challenge here is the use of the word some, right? There's some who have and some yes. who have not. And, and I'm more interested in the ones who have not. Yeah. Between computer labs as well as many of our schools purchase uh, uh, the laptop carts, but we'd have to get you that specific information. Yeah, yeah. It, getting me the information, that, that's great, because I'm going to do something with it, but I need to also know what you're doing about it. Mr. Canham? Um, Mrs. Truhot, just one other piece of information. We at Teaching and Learning, when we were preparing for the park assessment, asked, very similar questions. Do we have, now it's not a one-to-one, -one, right. but we did an assessment of the amount of equipment we have available for, and a plan for students to um, um, to use it. And so uh, that Mr. Thompson put that together, and I, I, I know it's not it's not one-to-one, -one, but it was like, do we have coverage? And over the last three years of doing PARC, we have we we have been successful in having the students take it online, which a lot of people didn't think we'd be able to to pull off. And so it's not to where we need to go. I'm not I'm not questioning the fact that we need to have our students more literate on on um uh, on the technology, but we we could pull that for you as well. That's another thing we could pull the um the audit of how much you know basically devices we have per school. I think that's something the public should know. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for raising it, and I think we, yeah, let's, let's, Commissioner High Cupboard? As presented in Teaching and Learning, it's on Board Docs, Teaching and Learning, but we can pull it up. Mm -hmm. But it was on Board Docs. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for raising it. I mean, we want to we wanna do better in park, so we want to make sure we're not hamstrung um, right. going in. Does the lack of practical skill contribute to the low test score? No, it's a reasonable question. Our third guest is uh, Melissa Schober.
Good evening, members of the board. Uh, later this evening on the agenda is the results of a rezoning feasibility analysis from Dijon Richter, and I'm here tonight to speak about that. That contract was awarded to Dijon Richter in September of 2015 for $248,700 and was due 12 months later. So the, the results of what, that we are getting tonight are in excess of one year overdue and no no-cost extension paperwork exists because I filed an MPIA to ask for it. That RFP was supposed to include an advisory committee on community and neighborhood dynamics as well as policy impacts, zone boundary scenarios and reports, and a detailed analysis of boundary scenarios and reports. I look forward anxiously to getting those since all that's available to date is slide sets. It appears that what's being recommended for further study are two choices, small choice zones and boundary reconsideration coupled with grade reconfiguration. For so the small choice zones, some of the areas that the consultants drew in their slide set tonight are geographically quite large and far from transportation options, and particularly with the results of bus link, it is very, very difficult for families to traverse areas of the city. In addition, not the, the districts that are proposed in the map in the slide set um, are not evenly drawn with a various number of high quality schools represented. There are between four and seven choices available to each of those small zones and they are not evenly set across the city. Um, not all have a sufficient number of high quality schools nor is the term high quality school well defined in that slide set. The boundary redraw is described, a, a, a flat out boundary is always redraw is described as extremely disruptive to families, but a boundary and grade reconfiguration is not, and I find that curious. All in all, from the outside looking in, this contract looks like we spent a quarter million dollars for an Ohio-based company that seems to have little or no knowledge of Baltimore's history with redlining or racial segregation, particularly in North Baltimore neighborhoods. And it doesn't look like they're coming up with solutions that advance equity, which we've all discussed here tonight and at the Kerwin Commission. Nor does it seem that this effort is well aligned with the 21st century schools rebuilding effort, because we're about to build 28 new schools, but we're not, it doesn't look like we're considering in line with that where those schools will be located, the demographics of those neighborhoods. It looks like the left hand and the right hand are not talking to each other because we're having a conversation about potential rezoning over here while the new buildings are going up over there. Um, and it doesn't look like we're really considering those changing neighborhood dynamics as we talk about rezoning and rebuilding of schools. But again, my main concern is we spent $248,000 when we just had a conversation about a budget shortfall on a study that's in excess of a year overdue, and I've emailed a variety of people in this building, and no one can explain to me with sufficient explanation, really no explanation at all, why this study is in excess of one year overdue when it was described as incredibly important during the RFP process. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Santelisis? So what I was going to do was um, make sure what I will say is that we will have staff follow up with you um, after directly so that we can make sure we know exactly what you've requested, what you've reviewed up until now, and where you're seeing the disconnect um, between the two. And we will have a chance to ask some further questions to when we have the presentation tonight. So, no, thank you. That concludes public comment for tonight. I'd like now to turn uh, to the consent agenda and ask for a motion to approve the items that were not pulled off of the consent agenda. Those would be items 8.01, BTU contract, 9.01, Chesapeake Center for Youth <laughs> Development, 10.01. 10.01, multiple vendors, 11.01, SAS, 13.01, Morton Salt, 13.02, Shaw Sports, 13.03, Motor Coach Bus, 13.04, T-Mobile, 13.05, T-Mobile, 13.06, Sparks, 13.07, Colossal and Tito Contractors, 13.08, Colossal and Tito Contractors, 13.09, Alliance Exterior Construction, et cetera. 13.10, P. Flanagan, et cetera. 13.11, GE Tignell Company, et cetera. So moved. Moved by Commissioner High Cupboard, second. 
Commissioner Bondima, second. All in favor? Commissioners Berkeley, Hassan, Hyde Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, Bondima, one abstention, nine zero nine zero one. I think we're now going to um, discuss the items that were pulled. I think that's right. So let's start with um, item 10.02, Judy Centers. I asked for this to be pulled um, because I, I really can't tell. It says the purpose of the amendment is to replace the vendor providing Judy Center evaluation service. So for switching vendors, had the first vendor started the work? Like, just help me understand the sequence here of how we can change vendors, what seems like in the middle of a contract, unless I'm reading it wrong. Hello. <clears throat> I'm Crystal Francis, Director of Early Learning. Um, the vendor was on the board to be approved in July, um, and so they, she was approved at that point, but she has not started work yet. Um, and so when we went and then reached out to Burke to see if they could provide the um, external evaluation. So she didn't start the work yet um, after she was approved. So we're just allowed, so we're, did we, uh, sever that contract for cause like what you can you just do that switch vendors in a contract or was it was she late and so you said i'm sorry you can't have this contract anymore i, I literally i'm just trying to understand the process by which after we approve a contract or was it that we approved a contract well actually i'm not going to try to guess all the scenarios just help me understand like what happens after we approve a contract for somebody Um, so after the, con well, really uh, immediately before the contract was approved, we received feedback from MSDE, um, <coughs> and they strongly suggested that we identify a new evaluator for our Judy Center programming for the, the upcoming school year, which is the school year that we're now in. Um, so we immediately sought out an additional um, provider that could do those services, but this provider never started the current year's evaluation. They're continuing to wrap up last year's evaluation for which they had a contract. And so they're okay just having been awarded a contract to not do the work? Yeah. She was fine with it. Okay. Any more questions on this item? It still seems strange, but I, I guess I understand. That, but that's what I'm looking for somebody to say, that she didn't perform. Is that? Yeah, okay. All right, um, motion to approve item 10.02, Judy Centers. Moved by Commissioner Hassan, second by Commissioner Chinney. All in favor? Commissioner Berkeley, Hassan, High Cupboard, Canham, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, Bondima. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Commissioner Kashani and Commissioner Pena. Uh, motion passes. Uh, 802. We pulled uh, a set of items 10.03, uh, 10.04, 10.05, 10.06. I'm going to defer first to um, Commissioner Hassan, who has a question on them uh, collectively. And if we have any individual items, then we'll go there next. Commissioner Hassan? Thank you. Uh, so my question related to these is basically how do they fit into either both our whole child work and our arts curriculum plan specifically, uh, and then how are we ensuring that they are su su uh, blah, 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 supplementing and not supplanting instruction by licensed teachers during the school day? Um, Laura Jones, manager of the Office of Teaching and Learning. Um, so I'm just going to walk through each one 
at a really high level um, to talk through how they fit in. Um, so the Baltimore Urban Debate League, um, as I, I think everybody knows, provides um, debate programming for students. They, they started um, several years ago focusing on secondary grades. Now they go all the way down to um, grade three, so students can actually engage in their programming from grade three all the way through graduation. Um, and that aligns very closely with our, um, our blueprint work around whole child and literacy. Um, this is programming that helps students, uh, you know, think about current issues that are relevant to their lives and ways to articulate their viewpoints on those issues, um, both to sway their peers and in some cases to sway um, anyone from the Board of School Commissioners to City Council, et cetera. Um, that programming is strictly outside of school hours. Um, so that's an after school program. There's summer opportunities. I'm sure there's um, competitions on the weekend as well, but that's not something that takes place during the instructional day. Um, the North Bay program is a one week environmental literacy program. There's also an option for schools to do a day trip version of the program where students leave their school and they go to the North Bay facility um, that is about, I want to say about an hour north of here. Um, and they are immersed in envir environmental literacy instruction um, for that time period. So again, that doesn't supplant anything that's happening during the school day. It's, it's really a trip. They, they market it towards mostly sixth graders, but some other grade levels sometimes attend. So my clarifying question on both of those is are we ensuring that, that schools are not using that to say, yes, I'm addressing the next, next generation science standards by sending my kids on this field trip? So are we ensuring that science is being taught during the school day? As well as with the debate piece, are we ensuring that speaking and listening and viewing standards are being met and the teachers aren't able to say, oh, the, my kids are in debate, so I don't need to address those standards? Yes, that this is absolutely additional on top of the the district curriculum that is required to be taught. So the North Bay experience, not every student goes through that experience, but for those that do, it's absolutely on top of the, the science curriculum that they would already be getting during their middle grades experience. Okay. Dr. Canham. Um, Commissioner Hassan, today at um, Teaching and Learning, we talked about North Bay in particular, but from also from the lens of equity, it is um, schools have to pay and there's a cost per child. And so we were asking um, staff to think about of the 28 schools to participate, there's only, there's only 28 schools, so it's not for every school. They choose, they pay. How many, how many then of those schools that go, how many students go and how many basically have to be left behind because they can't afford to pay. And most of them are Title I schools, but all the costs mostly aren't covered. But we're getting into that. But I think there's also an equity issue um, of who do we give this access to. So it's a great opportunity. I I ended up, I, I went to North Bay and slept in the, the cabins with um, 38th grade students so I can talk to you about that. <laughs> I didn't go to sleep that night but um, it's a phenomenal experience but I do worry about if we're offering it how do we give access to all, all the students. I do just want to point out and Laura you should correct me if I'm wrong that the the majority of the 28 schools though that are benefiting from this particular from the North Bay experience have all carved out the money correctly correct in their own budgets, correct? Yes. Right. So I, I do want to reemphasize that to the board that as we're having discussions about equity and which young people have access, that that is married to a fair student funding model. It is married to certain decisions about dollars and how they are deployed. So part of what we are getting into, and again, I'm just flagging it so that we all are realizing that past decisions, past approaches, actually have repercussions in the everyday decisions that, that principals make. We cannot, I, I would say that we have kind of two portions to this. One, we have said to school leaders <clears throat> and teams, you make decisions about this, and then to come on top and say, now we want everybody to go to North Bay, right? Is exactly, there's a rub there. So when we talk about equity, I think it's important that we grapple with the fact that for a decade plus, the board has supported a direction that is fair student funding, that is school-driven decision-making in key aspects. I would say within the last year and a half, we have tightened up around some of the academic 
um, goal setting and follow through on that. But I, I wanted to point that out, not, ju not just in reminding the board, but also for the public that's watching. It's not a central allocation of money that's saying we're picking these 28 schools. If your child goes to a school that chooses to use its money to take their young people to North Bay, right? That is part of their decision. We have not said as a district every middle schooler will go to North Bay. Thus, the equity question is intimately tied to the decision making that, that leaders and leadership teams make at their school. So I think that that's just an important context for us to keep in mind. No, that's really fair. And the, uh, the only other addition to that is, and then to make it work with the funding formula, um, certain schools are saying they put a fee on the on the students Absolutely. and so so it, 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 it I, I totally concur with your point yep. and just to be very transparent I think all of these programs are, are essential and wonderful uh, I just want to make sure that especially in schools where resources are scarce and principals are making these really hard decisions that they're not compromising the core academics to make it happen mm -hmm. no and, and that that question I think the team has done an excellent job in responding and completely understand your question. I just think, again, that I want to be clear as, as we approach the budgeting season, as we are holding community meetings around fair student funding, as we are talking to folks at schools that we realize in the case of, because I actually think it's a both and, right? I think it is, yes, we don't want it supplanting, but the, but the other side of that is this is a, f a lot of these, these, ex you know, these experiences that you see listed here are fantastic opportunities for kids. Um, you do more when you do hands-on science. You get to go someplace, stay overnight, and have that kind of experience. It's not just about the minimal, is it taking the place? I think the flip side as we talk about a whole child focus, right, is, is really acknowledging that even if the response is that these are in addition to foundational curriculum, that, that they are really important experiences. And going and digging in the Chesapeake to, as a water sample is very different than just opening a textbook and doing, and at, at least the team has done a good job in pushing to make sure those experiments happen. But if we have 28 schools that recognize it's the hands-on time in the environment that actually allows kids to make meaning of what they're reading about, then the question we have to face, which I would argue is also an equity question, is is it only kids who go to schools whose, people, whose, whose leaders decide that that's something worthwhile or have parents who will supplement mm -hmm. that cost because they recognize that it's okay? And in schools where you don't have a parent body who's going to supplement for their kids to spend three days at the Chesapeake, or we have, we have leaders or teams that don't recognize that that is just as important for development, then the, then the question for us as leaders within the district is, what do we do about that, right? Like, is that okay as a district to say that only 28 kids get a hands-on experience schools. to actually, or schools, schools, 28 schools get to do that when we know we have 180 schools? Like that, that to me is another cut at the equity yeah. question that we have to be willing to ask. And frankly, that's the question that's tied to Kerwin for, for me. That, that's the question, right? In other schools, and I'll just say it here, right? In my kid's school, if they ask me for the money for my kids to go for two days to spend on the Chesapeake, I will find some place to do that. We have families who can't. So the equity question is, if you don't come from a family who can sport that kind of support, what are we as a district saying about the learning experiences for kids in Baltimore and that they are only relegated to learning about it in a book and thankfully because we have a teaching and learning team that has said you have to have hands on science. Thank God it's more than just a book now and kids actually have hands on science. But that's why when people are saying what's Baltimore doing with the money? That's why I get heated about this because yes, if you only want a minimal experience then sure, I guess we could get everybody a book, but that's not a 21st century education, and that is not an education that we know young people deserve, and, and, and that we're, we are giving to some others because 28 schools have figured out how to get it to the kids in those schools. Right. So yeah, I'm a little passionate about this because when everybody's talking about where money is going, those, that's the question we need to be asking, is not why the 28. The question I'm asking is why I have 160 other schools with kids who won't get to ride the Chesapeake 
and who won't get to have an artist in residence come to their school. And that is a question of resources. And we can dawdle about it all we want to. That is a question of resources. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, call votes on these two items, and then we'll uh, have you guys talk about the, the, the next two because there's a separate set of questions. Similar, but maybe different. Um, do I have a motion to approve 10.03, Baltimore Urban Debate League? Moved by Commissioner Chinia, seconded by Commissioner Bondima. All in favor? Berkeley, Hassan, High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, Bondima. Nine approve, one abstention. Motion to approve item 10.04, North Bay. Motion by Commissioner Hassan. Second by Commissioner High Cupboard. All in favor? Commissioner Berkeley, Hassan, High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, Bondima. Motion passes 901. Uh, um, then there's two more uh, Fine Arts Extended Learning Services, uh, Arts Every Day, and then Academic and Enrichment Programs, Fine Arts, and Fine Arts uh, for Bring the Noise. So you want to just give us a brief summary and then we'll ask questions about those two. Sure. Um, so Arts Every Day is an arts um, enrichment organization. They provide, they, what they do is they partner with an existing art teacher in a school and with that school staff to provide arts integration support to the school. So their support isn't necessarily always an artist in the school, although there are times where they'll bring in actual artists to do assemblies or other different activities with students, but they focus a lot on PD for teachers to help them teach in an arts integrated method um, as really part of a whole school strategy. So when they're pushing into a school, they're not just targeting students that are in art class, but that they're helping teachers throughout that school to better infuse arts instruction in their content areas as well. My question, my question on that one, and this is just for a point of clarification, the, uh, the funding sources from the school budgets as I read that, is there, a, is there another part of the work we do with arts every day that's uh, centrally with the central office? There is. Is that so, a different contract? Um, the, it's, it's, it falls within this contract. So um, for the past several years, the district has allocated a certain amount for arts every day each year. Um, currently, that amount is $45,000. Um, that essentially goes to fund parts of their organizational costs because mu everything that they do is well below the actual cost of that work to schools. So for a school to partner with Arts Every Day, they're not necessarily even saying we're definitely going to pay for X, Y, and Z. Um, they pick schools to partner with and then they actually provide a certain level of funding to that school where they can essentially go through the menu <coughs> of options you see on that cost chart where they can say, you know, we're going to send our kids to X arts enrichment organization or ex cultural organization or we're going to bring in this teaching artist to do activities um, so, so is so is the 70 um, is this so it so if I hear, I'm hearing you right, that the 70 is not all from school budgets. Correct. So the, that includes the district allocation plus the amounts that schools pay in addition if they want to purchase additional exposure to this organization outside of what kind of automatically comes to them in the partnership. So I would just say for future reference on these kinds of contracts, because I suspect it's not the only one, I think your funding source explanation should be more clear. It, it's no okay to say both. School budgets for... Uh, central office budget for X and individual school budgets for Y. Because um, I, I thought that was the case, but it, and I it's, want to make sure. Any other questions on the Arts Every Day contract? Motion to approve the Arts Every Day contract, item 10.05. Moved by Commissioner Bondima, second. Commissioner Canham, all in favor? Commissioner. Commissioner Berkeley, Hassan, High Cupboard, Canham, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, Bondima. Any opposed? Abstention? Abstained, uh, Commissioner Pena, Commissioner Kashani. Uh, motion passes 902. 802. 802. I, I'm really actually good at math, even though <laughs> it's not really obvious tonight. <laughs> Jeez. Final item for discussion. Um, Item 10.0 say to bring the noise. Can you, th this was, yes, give a summary like you did, and, and I know I have some questions on this one. Okay. Um, bring the noise provides instructors in arts in the areas of music and theater 
um, and instructors for technology. Um, and what that looks like is they actually provide an individual that goes into a school and provides that instruction for students over the course of the designated time period, which could be the full academic year, it could be a quarter, it could be a semester. Um, one thing to clarify with this particular service is for fine arts, schools have to, they are required by Comar, and we re reiterate this requirement every year through our budgeting process, they have to staff at least a half-time fine arts BTU level professional that provides that instruction to students. And then in addition to that, it, for our larger schools, they have to staff to the ratio where they can provide fine arts instruction from a certified teacher to every single student in the school building building um, when we're talking about grades K through 8. When we get into high school, the requirements are a little bit different, but this is a K-8 provider. Um, so this vendor provides additional fine arts instructors on top of the, the certified teacher in the school for schools that are interested in. Typically, when I've talked to principals about why they've made the decision to partner with this organization. When they partner in the arts, it's typically because they, they have a teacher that provides one art form, but they want to provide exposure to another. So they might have a visual arts teacher in the building, but they also want to offer theater. Um, they've also shared that they will use this vendor particularly to provide a little bit more planning time for teachers. So they might not be able to set up their schedule with their teaching staff to have collaborative planning time weekly. So they might bring in this partner to provide extra arts exposure and then it frees up that time for teachers to meet together as well. So yeah, this one, you, yeah, you, since you knew our question, mm -hmm. you sort of preempted it. So that that's I helpful. I tried to lead with that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. no, that was good because this one, um, sort of jumps off the page because it's a million dollars. So I know that the Teaching and Learning Committee discussed this. I'm going to ask Commissioner Chinia if you could say a few words about this because this one, for a million dollars, you, you want to make sure that what we're doing is as systemic as possible. Um, so if... No, the question that came up during the Teaching and Learning Committee um, had to do with the evaluation mm -hmm. of this particular vendor. And um, if, you, if you want to say a little bit more, but I know we talked about the fact that you are currently um, doing an evaluation that this particular contract was just throughout through the end of this school year and that you were going to get some more information before recommending them again. That's correct. So we've made this recommendation to go just through the end of this fiscal year. Um, and the reason that we did that is because when we review the, um, the application documents, we request to see a number of different things to show evidence of effectiveness. And this particular proposal is very strong on qualitative evidence. There is a very clear demand from our principals that they want this program in their schools, but they haven't been able to provide us with the quantitative evidence we want to see. Um, because we're in the school year right now, we didn't want to suggest that we just cut the contract because we know that that could create some challenges for schools. Um, but we do want to make sure that we work closely with the vendor to get that evidence. Um, one thing that we've also decided to do and we've begun doing is we're sending our um, content experts on our team in to see some of the instruction while it's happening. So our instructional media person is visiting technology classrooms and our fine arts coordinator is visiting some of these fine arts classrooms just so that they can actually get a first-hand look at what this looks like on the ground. So that's very helpful and I know you just did this this morning so appreciate your patience with us tonight. Um, so we look forward to seeing the results of the evaluation um, and again, I want to make sure I understand that if, if this is the same or different from Arts Every Day. So for the million eighty, the funding source says it's out of each school's budget. So in this case, we're talking about $50,400 per school. Per that's correct. Right. So that's a lot of money for a school to be allocating to a contract versus a teacher. So I hear you, but I just want to flag it. Um, Am I under, is this one as stated, or is any of this out of the central office budget? This is exclusively from school budgets. And how many schools? I can do the math myself, but since I'm bad at math tonight, why don't somebody else do it for me? I, I think I read, I read somewhere in here was 30. Yeah, I think it's a 33 during 33. the school year. Okay. Hmm. You good? Well, do you have any other? I should, I should, that's the wrong question for you. Do you have any other questions? Uh, Martha, first, if you have, Commissioner. I'm glad to hear that all of our students in all of our schools have an arts experience from a licensed arts teacher, and I hope that we can see that continue and hopefully get these resources put towards a certified licensed teacher soon. 
Commissioner Bundima? Oh, okay. Yeah, I want to second what Commissioner uh, Haika, uh, boy, oh boy, Hassan, it's one of those H people to the right. <laughs> I, I want to, I concur with Commissioner Hassan um, that it's, it's something we want to keep an eye on, and so I hope when you do the evaluation you can really stare hard at that part of it, because um, we've had presentations from our arts partners before about the, you know, the decline of certified arts teachers in the schools and as uh, Dr. Santelisa said earlier, we, you know, we don't want to just meet the letter of the law, let's meet the spirit of it too, so, or something like that. All right, motion to approve um, item 10.06, bring the noise, Commissioner Canham, second, Commissioner High Cupboard, um, all in favor, Commissioner Berkeley, Hassan, High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, Bondima, Motion passes 901. Okay. That concludes, thank you for your patience and responses. That concludes our consent agenda. We now move to um, information and discussion. And first up, we are invite our external auditors from Clifton, Larson, Allen for them to make a presentation about our audit. Welcome. If you could introduce yourselves. Certainly. Uh, my name is Keith Novak. I'm a uh, principal at Clifton Larson Allen. With me this evening is Leslie Cornelius, who was the on site uh, manager of the engagement. Uh, normally with me is Eris Coleman, who is a uh, senior manager with the firm. Unfortunately, Eris is in Mississippi uh, right now teaching. So um, it was appropriate that she miss this evening. You said uh, that because you knew we'd give her a pass. <laughs> Well, you know, I just wanted to let everybody, you know, wanted you to know that we don't just do audits. We, we actually do a lot of uh, outreach and teaching as well as, as part of what we do. Um, what we'd like to do this evening is uh, just go over a few things. Um, basically go over our audit approach, what the results were, uh, certain required communications, and then go over some upcoming things uh, that we'll be hitting uh, next year and in the future. So our audit approach, um, the project was led by Clifton Larson Allen with assistance from King & King, who is our minority business enterprise uh, partner, and Phillips & Company, who is our uh, woman-owned uh, business entity partner. Um, when we uh, do our audits uh, with partners, we make those partners part of our team as opposed to just giving them uh, tasks and saying go do this uh, and then come back when you're done. Um, and we also look for partners who have experience both in governmental auditing and accounting as well as um, uh, education. Um, and so all the people that were on this job uh, have experience both in governmental accounting and auditing as well as uh, education. Uh, in addition to that, we also bring in IT specialists from our firm to look at the information technology uh, environment within uh, the school system. Uh, our approach is a risk-based approach. Uh, we look at um, the uh, financial statements and we look at the organization, to determine where the greatest areas of risk for material misstatement are, and we base our tests on that. Uh, Throughout the audit, we had frequent communication, including regular status meetings and information communications with management uh, for two reasons. One is it keeps us on track, and the other is it keeps management on track so that we can get everything completed in a timely manner. The uh, results um, was we issue an, audit, an auditor's opinion on the financial statements. It was an unmodified opinion, which is the highest level of opinion that can be given. The audit is done in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, uh, or given in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. The audit is performed in accordance with generally accepted audit standards as well as government audit standards, which is a higher level of standard uh, than just uh, generally accepted. Um, and the big difference there is experience in government auditing as well as certain CPE requirements. 
In addition to the auditor's report on the financial statements, we issue a report on internal control over financial reporting and on compliance and other matters based on an audit of the financial statements performed in accordance with government audit standards. A big, long way of saying we issue a management letter. Um, and on that letter, there were no material weaknesses noted. Uh, we're not allowed to say everything is great. Uh, we can only say we didn't have any material weaknesses. Um, now, as far as required communications are concerned, um, our responsibility under generally accepted accounting uh, standards or auditing standards is that the financial statements are the responsibility of management. Our audit was performed to form an opinion as to whether the financial statements have been prepared in accordance with GAAP and whether uh, they are not materially misstated. Um, the qualitative aspects, uh, management is responsible for the selection and use of appropriate accounting policies. Uh, significant accounting policies are disclosed in the footnotes in footnote one of the financial statements. Uh, footnote one, quite frankly, is accounting 101 for governments. So if you ever want to, you know, uh, read about accounting for governments, just read footnote one. If you want to fall asleep and you're having trouble, read footnote one. Um, the preparation of the financial statements requires certain estimates and judgments to be made by management. Uh, among these are the net pension liability disclosures, the depreciable lives of capital assets, claim liabilities for incurred but not recorded claims uh, for self-insurance and health insurance, compensated absences liabilities, and the allowance for accounts receivable. Uh, when we look at these estimates, we determine whether uh, they are in accordance with industry standards, whether uh, they were properly calculated, and we conclude that management had a reasonable basis uh, for the significant judgments and estimates uh, that impact the statements. Uh, we didn't have any sensitive financial disclosures. We didn't encounter any difficulties in performing the audit. Um, it says no significant dif difficulties, that's just standard language, but we didn't encounter any difficulties. Uh, we didn't have any disagreements with management on financial accounting or reporting matters. Uh, at the end of the audit, we asked management to prepare what we call a letter of representations. It's about a six-page letter. It basically says, we answered all your questions. Truthfully, we provide you with all the information. We didn't hold anything back. Um, and uh, we received that uh, with no issues. To our knowledge, management did not consult with any other accountants regarding audit or accounting matters. Um, prior to the engagement, we did not discuss any issues with management prior to our retention, uh, although we do have discussions throughout the year uh, on accounting matters that come up. Um, we didn't, uh, you know, have any discussions basically that said, uh, you know, we won't hire you unless you, you know, rule on this this way. Um, there were no additional uh, findings or issues not previously discussed. Um, in the financial statements, um, we do not express an opinion on required supplemental information. Um, that is something that's required to be put in the financial statements, but we do not issue an opinion on that. When your um, comprehensive annual financial report is finally put together, uh, there are certain other things that are in that report. Uh, such as the transmittal letter, um, organizational charts, and things of that nature, which we also do not uh, provide an opinion on. But we do look at those things to make sure that they are not contradictory with other information in the financial statements. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, a couple upcoming GASB pronouncements that uh, it may or may not have an impact, but we do want you to know about it. Uh, the first one has to do with other post-employment benefits. Um, the other post-employment benefit standard is changing and um, will require other post-employment benefits to be handled similar to the way pensions are handled now. Uh, certain asset requ uh, retirement obligations, that really won't have any impact on the, uh, on the city schools the way we see it. Um, that has to do with uh, how you record liabilities for assets that you will be retiring. And it's primarily geared uh, towards nuclear power plants and things of that nature, uh, which I don't think you have any. At least we haven't found it yet. Um, fiduciary activities, uh, this is a statement that is redefining uh, what 
trust funds are and fiduciary funds are, as well as agency funds. And we'll do away with the uh, term agency funds. And so that will have an impact, but it's not going to be that significant. And it's really um, going to uh, have an effect uh, for your fiscal 2020 financial statements. So that one's a way off. And then lastly, um, there's a statement on leases, which uh, will not be uh, in effect probably until I believe 2021 uh, for your financial statements, which will effectively require for any operating leases, uh, we record a liability in an offsetting asset. Um, and so that will have an impact, but it won't impact the bottom line. It will just impact the balance sheet. And with that, that's the conclusion of the remarks that I had prepared for this evening. Um, if there are any questions. Any questions for our auditors or John? Sure, I, John. I have just one comment to make. Sure. And, um, um, I just want to uh, recognize the fact that there are a lot of people in this building that do a lot of work to make sure that this happens every year. But um, Mary Ann Cox, who is our Deputy Chief Financial Officer, she's like the band leader for this annual dance. And we have, <laughs> we have several audit teams that are in the building now. And to keep everything going and, and keep it moving and keeping everybody satisfied behind the scenes takes an incredible amount of effort. And I just wanted to... Uh, call her out to the board. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks, Marianne. So we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening. You're probably going to stay. I think I stayed. Yeah, John, stay. for the preliminary uh, FY19 budget milestones? Yes. <clears throat> um, what we're doing here tonight is uh, we're just sharing with you what our um, fiscal year 19 preliminary budget milestone calendar will look like. It's not necessarily a presentation. It's just we're sharing it with the board this time to let you know certain areas that we're looking for for milestones or target dates throughout the fiscal year 19 budget process. Uh, the only thing that I will really bring out that, you know, uh, fiscal year 18 was a particularly challenging year uh, for city schools <coughs> and budget preparation. Um, although every year is a, is a challenging budget year, um, whenever you have uh, insufficient resources and increasing needs, um, you're always going to have, there's also going to be certain challenges in, in preparing the budget, but we don't expect the, uh, the type of thing that we had in fiscal year 18. Um, we do expect, or we are projecting at this time, that we will be able to bring the, uh, the budget to the board uh, for approval uh, a full month ahead of, ahead of where it was in fiscal year um, 18. Uh, I would have liked to have brought it back a little bit more, and potentially we might be able to do that at some point in time. But with the fact that we're working on the uh, changes to the fair student funding model and some other things, we didn't want to push back too far. I'd rather come back to you and say that we're ahead of schedule than have to come back each time and say that, you know, we have to push it back, push it back, push it back. So that's really the only comments that I have on, on the preliminary calendar. The only other thing that we haven't done yet is we're working with our communications people to uh, to set up the uh, the public hearings, the public meetings that will come, the community meetings, and once they are determined, then we will get those dates to the board. Annie, I have all. one question. So I'm, hmm? I, I'm I'm glad that we're going to get those dates out so people can plan. The one thing that we heard a lot uh, last year, and maybe it was unique to last year, was that for the school budgets, for the school leaders to meet with their communities around their budgeting priorities. Um, they just felt like the turnaround time was so tight that people didn't feel like they could really communicate well with their communities. Is that, was that unique to last year? That was unique to last year. Okay, we usually have a, a longer window for schools to be able to meet with their community members. We even build it in at certain times in, in the budget to make sure okay. there's ample time. Okay, yeah, because that, that was a, a real common chorus last yeah. year. Okay. Any other questions for John? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next um, uh, update and next steps for the Baltimore City Schools Rezoning Feasibility Study. So good evening, Commissioners and Dr. James Leases. I'm Nicole Stewart, the Director of Facilities Planning. Good evening, I'm Lynette Washington, the Executive Director of Facilities. And tonight I'll be presenting uh, an update on our rezoning feasibility study. As you are all are aware, 
the city schools initiated this rezoning feasibility study in order for us to understand our challenges around balancing enrollment and utilization in our schools. So I do want to preface this presentation uh, with just some context. So first of all, this study wasn't intended to make specific recommendations about zoning boundary changes. It was more about the district exploring some approaches with our consultant, De Young Richter, that the district can, can consider around rezoning. Also, even the approaches that we've identified tonight, uh, we aren't really making specific recommendations, but what we did is highlight the approaches that we think best align with what we heard from the community, in addition to uh, some of the district priorities. And lastly, uh, what we really wanted to do as part of this phase is really hear from the community. So part of the delay for this project, as was mentioned earlier, was for us to make sure that we had an appropriate community engagement strategy for this phase of the work. So this phase of the work was really about hearing from the community their values and their priorities around rezoning that would inform the, these approaches. And then tonight, uh, we'll also get into some of our proposed next steps for rezoning. And while this is the presentation that's being presented tonight, the full report will be available uh, to be posted on our website in the future, short future. All right, so in tonight's presentation, I will go over some of the background of the study, including the purpose and process, the district uh, profile data that the consultants developed, some of the community values that we heard from families and schools as part of our community engagement work. And then we'll talk about sort of the approach framework. So how we thought about, how we came to identify these approaches with our consultants. We'll also talk about how we evaluated these different approaches as well as some proposed next steps for rezoning. So purpose and process. So the district hasn't done a comprehensive rezoning in over 20 years. So many of the uh, challenges we face are likely related to, of course, portfolio changes that are occurring in the district, including uh, major renovations, CIP projects, the 21st century buildings plan, various closures and consolidations and great reconfigurations, but also related to the fact that these zones that we currently have are 20 years old and don't necessarily represent the residential patterns uh, that exist currently for students. So the first step in this study, first was for the consultant to, to produce a background data report, which is available on our website. And that background data report really confirmed a lot of what we had already knew. But it was uh, satisfying to see that confirmed through the data report. Uh, in addition, the next phase was for us to reach out to the community. So we had a community engagement strategy where we first talked to stakeholders and we asked them, well, what is the best way for us to approach the community as part of this process? And then we, had, we held eight community meetings in eight different planning areas across the city to, as I said before, hear what the community had to say and what were their thoughts about our challenges and what some, what their suggestions were for how we address them. At the end of uh, September, we did a community follow-up where we came back to the community and we reported out to them what was said. So the results of the surveys that were online and that were completed as part of the community meetings. So that report is also on the website and that includes some summary information about the responses to the questions in addition to very detailed information about comments that were made online at the meetings and that report gives a full understanding of the, th the different things that people said as a part of these meetings. Tonight we're presenting to the board a summary of approaches and also some steps, the next steps for a next phase of rezoning. So the district data profile, what did we learn? First of all, we know that utilization is unbalanced across the district. We have a high rate of students who are out of zone. About one third of our K through five students that attend a zone school don't attend their own zone school. 
As we know, enrollment has continued to decline and we expect it to continue to decline. And all of this really just makes it difficult for us to plan around these various challenges. The map to the right uh, is available in our annual comprehensive educational facility master plan, but really it's just a representation of what utilization in each zone school is expected to look like in school year 1920. So as you can see, even with the portfolio changes that we're making, uh, 21st century, we will still have some challenges with high utilization rates across the district. So as part of the community meetings, the community was asked to complete surveys that ask them questions about their thoughts about enrollment. Uh, what do we, as an example, if there's a case where a school is overutilized, what, what, what should the district do? So this really challenged uh, residents and family members to not only think about what they wanted to happen at their own school, but really more broadly, if they were responsible for all the students in the district, what are some of the things that, what are some of the decisions they would make, what are some of the things that they prioritize, and out of those community meetings, these are really the four things that were highlighted from families. First, they valued neighborhood schools, especially for uh, K through five or uh, K through eight students, they value neighborhood schools. In addition, when we asked families about equity, their response was they were most concerned about equity and access to quality programming. However, there were some families and responses that related to socioeconomic diversity in schools. And lastly, really, and we understand this as, as the planning department, that families don't want to these different changes to disrupt their students. So in thinking about how we then moved from what we learned during these community meetings to how we then started to think about these approaches. So we used this framework where we considered sort of this variety of community responses. First of all, as you can you see if you look at the report from the community meetings, there were, even though we highlighted some of the things that bubbled up the most, there were really a variety of community responses across different communities. As we know, different communities have different challenges, and of course they also have different opinions about what to do about those challenges. And we also wanted to balance that with some of the district priorities and make sure they were, uh, whatever approaches we developed were aligned to various initiatives that the district is considering or working on currently. And so the approaches that we came up with, of course we know that they all will have pros and cons, uh, but we also evaluated them based on various values and metrics in order to be able to compare and understand what the district, potential district impact will be for each approach. And so these are sort of the broad values that we identified in order to evaluate these different approaches. Of course, first, utilization, since that is part of our main challenge, how does each approach really balance or affect utilization. Equity and program access, since that is something that we're obviously interested in as a district and also the respondents to surveys and the families who came out, they highlighted as that being one thing that they definitely wanted this rezoning process to address. Does the option provide families with choice and access to top performing schools and programs? Of course, transportation is a huge issue for families, so even where uh, parents might want equity and access to different kinds of programming. They have potentially limitations based on transportation, so we wanted to understand what the impact on transportation would be. And then uh, this other value that we're calling predictability. So part of the challenges that we're facing right now uh, in planning for the future of city schools is the, some of the patterns that we see with how uh, students and families are selecting schools, it, um, it makes our ability to predict what will happen in the future difficult because of those challenges. So we wanted to understand how these approaches uh, at least in some way helped or contributed to improving the predictability of these, uh, of what is happening in city schools and planning for that. 
So it's best to think about the approaches that we'll present tonight along a spectrum. So the visualization that you see before you uh, goes from one end where students have multiple choices available to them to the other end where student assignment is based on boundaries, so essentially what we have right now, where students are assigned to a zone based on their current residential address. And so the different approaches that we'll talk about tonight uh, go from large choice area option where students have multiple choices across a large geographic area to a boundary approach, what we have right now, but redrawing those boundaries based on current residential patterns of students. And as I said previously, we're, as, as I walk through the next couple of slides and detailing some of the highlights from these different approaches, we're not recommending any one specific one and in fact, in the next phase, we are open to consideration, considering other kinds of options and approaches as a part of this work. But this is what we've explored so far. And all right, we'll get into it. So the first potential approach that we identified was a large choice area. So this approach is really modeled after what uh, is happening in Milwaukee, where they have a large uh, areas where students are, they have a, a home school, but they're able to choose from uh, various schools within their larger transportation region. So when we modeled this for our city schools, we combined different zones and different areas. Uh, the purpose, part of the way that this was developed, as you can see on the map, uh, there is a, the different programs on the map are represented by different uh, measures of school quality. So we work with the Office of uh, Achievement and Accountability in order to develop uh, the school quality measure that the OAA also uses uh, for other purposes across the district. And so we wanted to make sure that the groupings of these large choice areas, that high quality options, options that are uh, rated a four on this map, was dispersed, was available within the different large choice areas. So this for being the highest, like yes. the best. Mm -hmm. So, and I also do want to preface this by saying this was based on, uh, you know, our, the consultants work in addition to our analysis and helping them to develop what these areas are. But for any of these approaches, I think it's best to think about them as a demonstration. So nothing set in stone and not anything that uh, can't be changed. This is an example and a demonstration of what this approach could look like. So as a part of this option, each student would have approximately eight to 13 options available to them. In addition, there, for something, for an approach like this, there would, of course, have to be many conversations around actual implementation, specifically around um, uh, transportation. And so this uh, slide just goes through some of the pros and cons of this uh, approach. So as a part of having more choice available to students, what we would likely have to do is set enrollment caps in order to uh, uh, limit utilization, but ideally with setting those enrollment caps, this would us help us in balancing utilization by setting them, those enrollment caps. Enrollment caps by school or by area? By school, it would have to be. It would, any of these options are limited based on uh, the availability of space in the building. So even where these options have more choice, programs will always be limited based on space and capacity. So some of the other pros for, for this particular approach, uh, it would provide the same opportunity for students. There's more uh, potential for diversity since students would have access to a number of different programs within these large choice areas. But of course, uh, the, the main uh, con for this approach is that we would have to review transportation policy because many of the, in order for these to be real choices for students, uh, we know that our transportation policy provides, uh, um, we have a walk zone within one mile. But of course, if students have choices and options to attend schools beyond the one mile, students in, at the PK-5 level, we would have to greatly consider our transportation policy. 
And of course, with any of these uh, choice options, uh, I think there is a concern across the community that the more savvy a parent will be able to get their child into the school, uh, a high quality school or their school of choice. So that's all, always a risk with these kinds of assignment strategies that emphasize choice. And again, uh, students may potentially get stuck with it attending a score, a score low on their, their list. So they have the opportunity to attend these schools within their region, but they might end up at a school that is not high, very high on that list. So this we, is one. Finish your sentence, my bad. That's fine. You were in the middle of a sentence. I was going to say, uh, uh, so this is an approach that, uh, based on staff's review, that we would not pursue. And it's probably also important to uh, note that Milwaukee, they originally had four zones, and they increased to eight. So even though these look like large choice zones to us, they are moving towards having smaller zones as a part of that district's approach. Okay. Sorry about that. Question from, from Commissioner Frank. Yeah. Thank you. The regional approach, does that apply K through 12? So no. So all of these approaches apply to our zone schools. So we currently have 104 zone schools right. and city schools, in addition to so, our yeah, but, charter but schools. That which, which level, though? Yeah, Dr. what? K through 5, and then our, also our K through 8 schools. And it also includes our conversion charter. No, so, but we, we don't currently have choice K to, K to 5, although right. we saw one third of K to 5 are attending out of zones. Yes. yes. We don't have a formal but choice. We pretty much choice. have choice. Well, but I'm, we have choice. But, sorry? No, oh, they're not talking about charters, though. And I was curious that one. Choice. We do have choice. I was just responding to the slide that said one third of <laughs> K to 5 students are attending. Out of zone, out of zone, zone schools. schools. But what I was charter, curious about. But it could be charter. It could be charter, right. Yeah, but but what I was curious about when we're talking about this approach, this regional approach, mm -hmm. and I, forgive me, I, I think I should know more about this than I do, but are, you, are we proposing that that would include K to 5 or that would remain the same? So it would only affect our, right, it would only affect our zone schools, our K to 5 and our K through 8 schools, our 104 zone schools. Same schools that are in doing it now would. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't change. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so that, that is, uh, I should step back a bit and say that yeah. part of um, the importance of this presentation is that it is proposing, we're well, not proposing, it's entertaining, exploring choice at the elementary school level. Right. So what I'd like to do is if people, as the, she's making the presentation, if people have clarifying questions that would that you feel are necessary to actually understand the presentation, mm -hmm. let's take those. Yes. Um, do you have one of those? Yeah, I have one of those. Mm -hmm. Because it, sometimes you can't follow a whole presentation yeah. if you get stuck on something. Sure. I, I just, I, I, I didn't know that a third of our students in K through five don't attend their zone schools because you just, how does that work? Yeah, so, that's a shocking number. so, so they, they show up, so they apply to charter schools or they try, they, they just go to another school's principal and if the principal has space, they, they can let them in. So before we, oh, oh, oh. Time, I'm, 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 time out, okay. time out. I just have a clarifying Peter question. Peter asked the question, <laughs> let's let her answer How does it, it work? So before we ask answer that question, let me give some additional context. So Please. about a third of our K-5 students attending zone schools are out of zone. Now when we look across the district okay, and include, zone. right. So but when we look across the district that all uh, K-5 K through five students attending any of our schools, including charter schools, that number rises to about 43% of go. all wow. students don't attend their zone school. So there's a, sh there's a shocking number. So we have some questions and reactions to that. And that you don't think that's shocking? I, I just well, wanted to follow up to understand how Then it doesn't really mean zone. Commissioner, Commissioner Chinia? I, I, I just need to bring the context of a person who's been around a long time. We have always <laughs> had. We've always had a process where a parent could do a request um, for their child to be out of zone. And if the, if the school requested, if the principal, you know, indicated that there was space, yep. then a student could be out of zone. So we, I don't, that number is not necessarily oh. shocking or high to me. I, I okay. just never knew how it worked. Like, so a student, you know, a, you know a, a parent can just advocate for their student to any school. And if the principal says yes and there's space, they can make room for them. 
Pretty so, much. Okay. I won't get into the details of what happens in enrollment, choice, and transfer, but I will say as a part of this process, the understanding is that those decisions are made at the school level about whether or not to enroll students out of zone. Commissioner Frank? I do think the third, one third number is a surprising number, and, and that doesn't include charters. It sounds like with charters, it's 40%. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so, so it's just interesting to me that we technically don't have choice at the K-8-5 level, but we have a process to allow students to go to out of zone schools. But what does that mean for this whole process? How do we plan for that? How does it account for fair student funding and one school's ability to have enough money to operate versus another school that's attracting more kids and getting more revenue? <clears throat> I'm just curious, how is that managed? Well, and I want to, because I, I know Dr. Washington wants to jump in, but but I do want to say that to, to to their credit, again, those figures, as you just noted, Commissioner Frank, went up when we added charter schools. It's not charter schools that's driving it. To 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 Commissioner Chinia's point, so it, it is. I mean, and I remember when I first looked at the figure, what was the thing I said? Mm -hmm. we, we already have choice, right? right? Like, I mean, we, we already have people that are walking. But go ahead, Dr. Washington, can you talk a little bit about how you all have incorporated mm -hmm. that into this process and in some of the recommendations you're making? Right. So, so and, and I think that one another point of context is that our students aren't traveling across the city to go to other schools. A lot of times it's just an adjacent zone, particularly for our K through fives. Um, most of these students are going to the school that actually is closest to them and their to their address. And, but it becomes difficult for us in planning because we don't know. There's sometimes there's shift. There is a good leader at one school, and right. so the students shift to the the children in the neighborhood shift to that particular school. So we have challenges within this whole process. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that we were looking at in the context of all of our different options was that the fact that is that um, because a lot of our students are already participating in ch some form of choice, then how do we make that as almost a policy too that we and it's not a disruption for a large number of our students so when we're looking at these various scenarios we're saying what are some of the scenarios that actually work within the context of what's happening within the district now commissioner high cupboard um, so I've been on this board for a long time as many of you know and when and Dr. Andreas Alonzo was here he was very very clear about his strategy for portfolio for this district so I'm so shocked that all of you were saying this is a surprise because it's not a surprise in the least. It was very clear that we are going to give schools a site-based decision making and they can do what they want at those schools and their, their, their goal was to attract more kids to their schools and fill those seats, okay? And those schools are the ones that capitalized on the fair student funding model and we didn't anticipate all the problems with fair student funding that we're anticip we understand now about lack of arts or PE or whatever else, but there was a distinct strategy in this district to make sure that schools attracted folks and parents would leave with like, their feet and they would leave schools if they were not satisfied and then that would let, in, let us indicate sort of what schools are working and what schools weren't. And it was almost like a let's filter the schools out by their own maneuvering. And so for the board to say this is surprising, this, I'm, I'm just shocked because it was distinctly a plan to actually do this. Commissioner, I covered, and I've been on the board for four and a half years. What you just said is the clearest explanation I have ever heard. I have no, never been you. part of a conversation about that. I came a day after Dr. Alonzo left, and we have never had this discussion mm. at the board. So I'm glad we're looking at fair student funding, and yeah. I'm, gl I'm sorry it's a shock to some of us because the numbers are really high, and it just shows the value of kind of taking periodic, even if we are behind on the contracts, it does show the value. No, it's okay. It's okay. It does show the value of, <laughs> of raising these issues and taking a look at these numbers so we can uh, stare in the face of these policies and making sure we're still with it. So you were still I, talking I just want about. To finish by saying, Andy, you keep saying we don't have choice at the elementary level. We we do have choice at the elementary level, and it's, it, we do. I mean, it's, <laughs> we do have choice because we have charters. And if a school by policy basically has open seats, yeah. the principals can fill them. So we do have choice. It's not a managed choice process where you have to put one through five and the district runs it. But we have choice. We shouldn't sort of keep saying publicly we don't because we do. I know, but I just want to make sure we're, we're clear about it. It, Commissioner Frank? I appreciate the history because I didn't know that. I've been here for less, less than two years and I have not heard our K-8 to um, enrollment as described as choice and I understand there's a process. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, it sounds 
particularly Darwinian, and maybe that was the idea for Dr. Alonzo, but, but, but if that is our policy, that we are sort of Darwinian at that level, and that the, the better principals and the better teachers and the better schools and the better facilities get more kids, that should be clearer than it has been. I agree. And I don't I think that's been clear to okay. some members of the board. Clarifying. The part of a portfolio yes. model district, the board sort of studied this in a, year, well, a long time ago, is that, that exactly what that is. So there was a portfolio strategy going across the country, and some have abandoned it and some have kept it. And so what I've asked before is this district needs to determine what we're doing. If we, are we in a portfolio strategy district? And if so, what does that mean? And the board should really to, to take it yeah. under consideration. Commissioner Bondima. We've been on the board a year, but I can tell you that I think the parents know that they have choices. Even though, <laughs> really, am I right or wrong? You're right. Yeah, because even though the board members might not have that discussion, I think most parents know and they talk about the <coughs> fact that they they have choices. So I, I think this has sort of been around for a very long time. Am I correct? Thank you, Commissioner Cooper. So when I reviewed the presentation. Uh, I, I begin to think about this question of choice, which I've always wrestled with, uh, because when you have declining enrollment, essentially we have a shell game, because we as a board are not closing schools fast enough. If you want to have a Darwinian perspective around education, saying that people vote with their feet, we, and then we have a fair student, fair funding model that says money follows students, we inevitably are placing ourselves in the situation which we have every year where we have small schools that where kids are not going to receive everything that they need. And so as we go through this zoning process, as we go through this fair student funding process, as a board, uh, we have to acknowledge um, certain realities. And uh, if we're going to maintain this perspective, I don't know whether it's good or bad. Um, if you maintain it, you have to close schools faster. And that is always the toughest discussion in December. Uh, but. Should we move on? I, I think, I, yeah, I, let's, let's complete the presentation and then let's have further discussion, but appreciate your patience with us as we now, all get caught up with where we are. And as a matter of fact, I just want to say that I'm excited that the board is having this conversation because this is some, a conversation that we've been having at the staff level for months and going back and forth about, you know, how to think about these different approaches and the implications of them. So this is a very important conversation that we're glad we're having. Uh, two things from that discussion that I do want to highlight, uh, I think as Dr. Washington pulled out, uh, uh, said earlier, you know, these students really aren't traveling that far, but I think that also speaks to the fact that we have zones that possibly don't necessarily make much sense right now. They, they were drawn 20 years ago. Uh, and also, secondly, even though we say, you know, we don't have choice, but we do have choice, I think as I'll talk a little bit later, some of the approaches that we've highlighted as ones that we think we should move forward with uh, really could be a way for us to formalize that so we can have a better understanding of how to plan for uh, how students are moving across the district. Approach two uh, is a small choice area. So uh, this air, this approach is similar to the large choice approach where it's a grouping of uh, different zones, but it is, of course, a smaller number of zones grouped together. Uh, the number of options available in this approach would be approximately four to seven, and similarly, they were grouped together, keeping in mind the quality rankings of each, uh, each, diff each program in the district. And so again, students would have a home school, they would have a zone school, but they could select from a uh, school within the area. So this one, this approach is actually very similar to what we just described as already happening with students attending uh, zone schools that are directly adjacent to them. Some of the pros for this approach, it satisfies that feedback from the community about having uh, neighborhood schools. And as I said, it reflects this current pattern of students attending uh, nearby zones. 
But of course, again, one of the cons with even considering some of these more formalized choice approaches is that the savvy parent will figure out a way to get their child into high quality schools. And as we have these discussions about equity, that's something very important for us to consider. And especially when, uh, as Commissioner uh, Cannon said, you know, you know, one parent may know that they can go to a school and request a, a seat and get in, and some other parents may not know. So uh, that's one consideration for how we might move forward with thinking about this approach is formalizing the process could help us to address some of these questions around equity. So the home-based choice approach uh, really reflects uh, what has been called the Boston model. So uh, Boston went through a uh, redistricting, well, a process where they actually did away with all of their zones, and they don't have any attendance boundaries, and the options available to students are based on proximity. So it's similar in that it represents a small area, but instead of group zones, it is based on uh, options that are available to students within a mile of where they live. Not only, and including the closest high quality option available for a student. So the uh, pros for this approach uh, limits uh, transportation costs because the options are within a mile of where a student lives, but also the cons is exactly that, the geographic distribution of programs. So if, you, if we go back to uh, this visualization, this is an example of two students. So this student at the bottom, uh, within a mile, they only have one option available to them. A student at, in the top visualization, they have multiple options available to them. So as a result, this is not a approach that we would uh, pursue moving forward with just based on the geographic dispersion of our, I'm sorry, that I would recommend. Yes, exactly. Uh, based on those challenges with uh, how the programs are distributed across the city. And so this next approach is. Question for Commissioner Cooper. I have a question about the previous slide. I just want to understand what the con means when you say students in less dense areas could have fewer choices due to proximity. Help right. me understand that a little better. So that is related to this visualization. So this, the purple star in the middle is represents the student. Okay. Uh, the green area represents a one mile walking zone for a student. And then the yellow dots represent the actual programs the, uh, that are available in the area. And so, as I said, the, um, on the lower half, that student would only, as a, if their choice options are all the options that are within a mile from them, they would only have the one choice. There are even some students as a part of this analysis who wouldn't have any choices within a mile uh, from where they live. And so, the concept here is. Are you talking to, about currently right now in Baltimore City? That's the. Yes. That's that would occur. Yes. So we have a lot of schools in clumped together. Is what you're telling me? Oh, definitely. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, depending on the, you know, the the area. <laughs> that was new. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And so this next approach was really us uh, looking at where the district is and looking at some of the priorities around and some of the actions that we're already taking around uh, great reconfigurations that we're suggesting as part of the portfolio process. And so this approach is really us, what we did was to look at some potential options for where we could uh, make some small boundary changes and make some do some great reconfigurations. So this particular approach is similar to we to what we already have in that it's boundary based assignment, meaning that of course a student is assigned to a school based on where they live. They would have one option. But what we for this particular approach, this was about us really trying to come up with some examples to um, help with the analysis that would help uh, some of our. Um, some of our portfolio actions that we are uh, considering. And so this was more of a case by case analysis coming up with uh, some of s places around the city where uh, these kinds of uh, great reconfiguration of small boundary changes will work. 
So of course, uh, with this particular approach, uh, the, there's an opportunity to create more stable matriculation uh, pathways for parents. <coughs> so in some of our previous portfolio actions, we're creating uh, sometimes PK through two or three to eight programs. So a student uh, would attend the PK through two, and then they would also then go on to attend the adjacent PK uh, three through eight program. And also this approach allows us to really consider uh, something that we've been talking about around not only small schools, but also small middle grades. So as you all are aware, we're uh, reviewing our middle grade strategy. And we feel that uh, this approach, con moving, conducting further analysis with this approach would help to uh, continue to inform that middle grade strategy. But one thing we do have to consider as a part of this is that we are limited by the size of our buildings. So a lot of the easier consolidations we've that uh, as a part of 21st century and other portfolio changes, we have uh, done them. Uh, so when we are looking at some of these potential grade reconfigurations and considering having a, um, a stable size middle grades program, we have to keep in mind that some of these PK through five and PK through eight buildings are small. So we have to keep that in mind. But this is an, uh, an approach that we would uh, recommend to move forward with conducting some further analysis. And then lastly, the last approach, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the existing boundaries were drawn about 20 years ago. So what we asked the consultants to do was to look at what it, what it would look like if we did a wholesale redistricting and redrawing of boundaries across the district. So the consultants used a methodology called location allocation where they looked at every individual a student currently within city schools and then assigned them to the closest school up to, 80, up to the school being at an 86% utilization rate. And so some of the pros, this would continue to do, the assignment strategy would be what we have right now. Uh, we will be correcting uh, the existing zones to account for current residential patterns. But of course, this would be very disruptive. So when we looked at what uh, the zones could potentially look like with this kind of methodology and this kind of redrawing, we determined that this wasn't a recommendation that we would, um, we would as a, at a staff level want to pursue because of the uh, disruption to students. And we think that the goals that we have can be pursued by, can be accomplished by some of these other approaches. So when we're trying to balance, what, what really is our goal to balance enrollment, to balance capacity and considering some of these other goals around uh, equity, we feel that some of these other approaches uh, could be best, better aligned with uh, what's going on across the in, in various areas across the district. So just in summary, uh, as I said previously, it's best to think about this rezoning, um, rezoning feasibility study as a demonstration of potential approaches. We, as you can see, we didn't make any specific recommendations about uh, changing zones, changing specific zones, but more thinking broadly about the approaches we could consider. And also, I, don't, I think what we also found is that there isn't necessarily a one-size-fits-all approach uh, for all the different areas across the city. We have some areas, like the southeast, that are overcrowded, and we don't necessarily have enough capacity to serve the students in that area. Then we have other areas uh, across the city where uh, the students uh, aren't, uh, the programs aren't concentrated, and so we have to think about also sort of the underutilization of our programs. So as a proposed next steps, our proposed next steps include doing that deeper dive that I just described and looking specifically at the challenges and programs and areas and aligning the appropriate approaches uh, to those specific areas. Um, I think that, that would entail really a long review of sort of our enrollment and assignment across uh, different areas and, and schools across the district. And as a part of that, we would be looking at not only program changes in programming, but also changes in policies around transportation, out of zone, as we mentioned, we 
I think that the district need to come to some decisions about what we do about out of zone either way whether or not we enhance it or uh, formalize it or whatever it is we as a district need to make those decisions and and also equity so this is something that we've all, all obviously been looking at uh, we have been using the community conditions index broadly across the district in addition as a part of looking at this analysis some of the impacts that we looked at so the percentage as for each approach as an example of students who might have access to a high performing school we also looked at what that would look like for students who live in low investment areas based on the community condition index so that's something that we're cons we're looking at but definitely in terms of policy that's something we will need to consider as a part of uh, this next phase and I think part of uh, what we're asking the board to do in this next phase is really work with us to develop some guiding principles for how we go about this work and how we do that alignment and how we look at different policies so that's what tonight what we're asking the board to do I'm not sure if you have any feedback about sort of the staff recommendations about approaches to uh, pursue or to not pursue but that is also what we uh, would like to hear uh, back from the board either at this at this meeting or at a later session we would like to engage you and get that feedback from you and then as a part of this process we envision a robust community engagement process so when we started this rezoning feasibility study and we really started to develop and think about what was the appropriate level of engagement at this phase so since as I said this is a was a more broader demonstration we didn't pursue some of the uh, pieces of the engagement strategy that didn't necessarily align with what we were actually doing but within the next phase when we're actually when we're going in and looking at actual changes we want to make sure that we visit each community and work with them and have them be a part of that process and at the end of that we intend to have some recommendations all right so other uh, questions feedback Tina so th thank you for the presentation um, I think it's it's a hard for us to have the discussion at this moment mm -hmm. I think we need more information yep. um, besides the PowerPoint I mm -hmm. need documents from mm -hmm. the from the folks who do the research mm -hmm. so I can read it for myself mm -hmm. I think though a board work session makes sense mm -hmm. on having a full discussion around the different options both the ones you recommend and the ones you don't recommend and the others we can pull to the table sure. So I would offer that that's sort of the process we should go with because it's hard to sort of in, in isolation of one presentation. We have lots of ideas, other things have come up around portfolio, closed schools, or all that. So it'd be helpful to put all that on the table, what needs to be considered, and then have a work session around that. So I'd, I'd like to see that happen. Um, a couple other things. During the, part, the beginning of the presentation, you talked about the feedback that you got from the um, public in the, mm -hmm. in the engagement. Um, couple things that uh, one thing I heard at those meetings that I didn't see on your slide mm -hmm. was property value concerns mm -hmm. and these aren't just from parents of our city schools these are residents of Baltimore City in general mm -hmm. who are also going to be greatly impacted by what we do here mm -hmm. and so we need to think about as we're trying to raise population in our city and we're trying to raise population in our schools that we have to really think of property values and what happens when we do this rezoning and what that means and so I would I would say I saw no mention of sort of the planning department in the city or those kinds <coughs> of things. How do we integrate what the city's doing, what we're doing, and the community concerns in general, not just our parents and kids, but overall, so, make, so our city feels good about this, right? Not just the district. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm all about equity and I'm all about getting right, what's right for our kids. I just don't want folks to move out of the city because we've done something like this, mm -hmm. right? We need to keep our population here. And this that really is a concern of mine. Although we have so much choice as we just talked about earlier. Um, lastly, um, we, what are your, criteria to the criteria in the beginning of the parents indicated were sort of socially social, social economically and racially diverse schools mm -hmm. and neighborhood schools at the same time right we live in a segregated city mm -hmm. so I'm just putting that out there that that's not really possible in the current configuration that we have so I'd like to see us as a board sort of debate that and figure out how that works mm -hmm. because we do have very segregated neighborhoods and then we have end up having very segregated schools unless they're schools that are sort of exercising lots of choice so Thinking that through, I think, is really critical, given the, the community has said they want both of those things to happen, because you can't have a neighborhood school and then or the neighborhood's one race or one economic mm -hmm. track. So. so I will say that uh, 
So thank you for that. That is important feedback. And that is something that we struggled with uh, in terms of how we characterize some of the responses. As I mentioned earlier, there was a variety of responses. In addition, sometimes a lot of it conflicted. You know, people, residents say they want neighborhood schools, but as we can see based on the numbers, uh, maybe it depends on what they consider neighborhood schools. They're not necessarily attending their zone school. So a lot of Part of this was balancing what we heard, what we see, and then coming up with some approaches that tried to uh, satisfy both. If I could also just add to what Dr. Stewart just said, that um, j just for a bit of national context, in at least three or four urban areas and soups that I've talked to, this is playing out across the country, and I think, in, in frankly, in some cities, far more starkly than even in Baltimore, um, that that it is it it is those two messages. Some of it is who wants neighborhood schools. Some of it is, as Dr. Stewart noted, how we define neighborhood schools. Um, I want equity as long as it doesn't doesn't impact my kids. I mean, it, it's a lot. So I just want to say that I think we also need to take into account the larger context. And in a lot of ways, Baltimore is reflective of what a lot of um, communities are going through. And I, I think that the commitment to the engagement process is that we'll still have productive, the kind of productive conversation. And I think your recommendations about work session in between are, um, I think, very helpful. I, just wanted to I want to ditto the call for a work session, but I would ask, given uh, that um, <coughs> the beginning of that, um, given the discussion that we, we had very quickly there, when you quoted back X number of years, uh, Dr. Alonzo's, how he teed up this, that it be put in the context of what you think and where we are now. Mm -hmm so that we can all be on the same page at the same time about why we're doing what we're doing. So mm -hmm. we don't feel like we just kind of happened into this. Some people have understood it from a long time of being in this system and in this city. Some people understand it from being on the board for a long time. Other people understand it because they know how parents are making choices. Some people are like, holy cow, we have this mm -hmm. much choice. So that's a lot of different like understandings on the board and I don't think it's because we missed a class. I think it's like we, we haven't talked about this in a while. So when we have that work session, please put it in context so we know where we are now. Second thing is, for me, uh, my big takeaways are we need more quality options. We need more quality options, and we need more quality options. That's coupled with some aggressive enrollment strategies. And oh, by the way, a better transportation system would go a long way. Um, and without those three things, it's unlikely that we're going to ever feel satisfied as a district. And there's books written about how housing policy drives s right. school mm -hmm. segregation. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, in our housing policies, there's a, there's a, there's a hallway exhibit right. that yeah. can take, you know, pause and look at that and it'll take you to school on how we got where we are on that. So, I, Commissioner I wanna, Frank. I think what Commissioner um, Hycubber said and what you said is so important. You, you, you both identified goals that go beyond the goals that have been identified in this presentation. So on page three, it says the purpose is for a balancing enrollment and space in our buildings that benefit our, all students. But it is so much more than that. And I think mm -hmm. it's worth stepping back and thinking what are the objectives of this process mm -hmm. because it's working with the city, it's transportation, it is, it's equity, it is there are implications that go far beyond just this fairly narrow, narrow objective. And it might be useful to step back and think about what are the broader, the larger objectives that mm -hmm. this is, um, this will impact or this is intended to, to serve. Further discussion on this. Thank you very much. The final presentation for the evening is the um, annual report on the JKA student discipline policy. Good. Thanks, everybody. If you guys could take a second and introduce yourself. What's the matter? Nothing. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to take. Oh, a, I'm going to take. You, you take said that to him. I thought you said that to me. <laughs> I just wanted Dr. to take Santa a quick Davis, second. Could you have your team introduce themselves? Oh, Sean. Um, thank you. Thank you. I've been quiet all night for the most part, right? 
Um, good evening, Dr. Sandalises and commissioners. Uh, before we begin our annual report on student discipline, I just wanted to take a second to express how excited we are about our improvements, improvements with student discipline and re, uh, reducing the number of suspensions across our district last school year. Um, in this upcoming presentation, you're going to hear about uh, some of our various supports and strategies that have been put in place to um, increase awareness about the importance of school climate, as well as some supports and strategies that have been put in place to support our educators, as, and most importantly, our students. This improvement has, uh, has not come without challenges. Um, some challenges that we are still working on, such as uh, focusing on and reducing suspensions for our students with disabilities, and some challenges that we have already addressed, such as uh, Last school year, we entered the year with too many of our schools uh, not being trained properly on how to input the information into our new student management system, um, Infinite Campus. Um, by the end of the winter, we had all of our traditional schools trained on how to input this information, and we learned lessons from this. And currently, we have consistent systems in place to ensure that uh, our new principals uh, were targeted this past summer and um, we offer consistently offer refreshment cor refresher courses for um, our school teams. With that, I would like to turn it over to our newest executive director, uh, Dr. Sarah Warren, to kick off tonight's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santalizas and commissioners. I'm very pleased to be here tonight at my first official board meeting. Um, and because it's my first meeting and I'm on day seven, um, the team has kindly rallied behind me and they're going to do the presentation, but I will, I will stay up here um, and help answer questions as needed. So I will turn it over to Dr. Garnett. Good evening. We're we'll please start with our introduction, uh, Commissioner uh, Kashani and CEO Santelis is as far as the members who are present tonight who will, will be presenting this presentation. Good evening, Eric Banzac, uh, Prevention Intervention Office under the Whole Child. Good evening, Lori Hines, Coordinator of Climate and Suspension Services. M Mike Haw, Data Analyst in the Schools Office. Louise Bank, Director of Home and Hospital and Health Services, in now in the home child, Whole Child Office. And Everett Garnett, Director of Suspension Services. Slide one of the presentation of the JKA Student Discipline Annual Report. Uh, this is a slide two, yes. conclusion of the third reader. Uh, if you recall, we had three <coughs> opportunity, opportunities to go through the uh, board policy to get to this piece. And on the 28th of February 2017, we were able to then bring a conclusion to the third reader to prepare the JKA which is the school board's um, policy, which uh, whereas we changed the name to behavior intervention and student discipline. Uh, then from that session, the Office of Suspension Services, we then engaged over 20 additional stakeholders where we had our meetings and we were able to get input and feedback from them. There was a back and forth as far as trying to get it right as far as getting the feedback and giving the stakeholders um, in the community an opportunity to share with us uh, information pertaining to the board policy. How did it? <laughs> in reference to the board policy, JKA, so we're very pleased to have those members engaged with that. Uh, those members can be found in the board memo um, in our appendix. We have a listing of those stakeholders and organizations that uh, gave feedback to us. Also, in addition to that, in response to the feedback uh, in JKA, the board policy section six, under, under the compliance piece, uh, we also indicate the trend data, uh, which will be presented tonight in various slides to show that how we have embedded the feedback into tonight's presentation and into the uh, board policy JKA and companion regulations JKA, RA through RE. On this slide, you will see the data summary from last school year, school year 2016-17. This data is broken out um, over a five-year period. It shows trend data, and this data is broken into two subgroups, which are in-school suspensions and out-of-school suspensions and expulsions. 
So in school suspensions is just what it states. Um, and out of school suspensions comprise, is comprised of short term suspensions, long term suspensions, extended suspensions, and expulsions. So all of those suspensions are grouped into that one category of out of school suspensions. And last school year, 2016, we had 6,778 out of school suspensions, which again um, was comprised of all of those different categories of out of school suspensions. Uh, one of the programs that we've used to improve services to students has been our mental health program, and we have mental health and substance abuse programs. Currently, over 120 schools are, are provided with extra mental health services inclusive of counseling, anger management, substance abuse disorders, treatment services, and through that's through the expanded school mental health program. And 15 district schools have substance abuse programs. We've seen an, uh, 9,067 students in the expanded school mental health program and we presented 6,655 school-wide activities where we've worked on these different areas like anger management, the kinds of things that give rise to suspensions, and we've presented uh, total group sessions for group counseling for kids, 3,721. They are presented on a full-time basis or a part-time basis at district schools, and the schools are identified based on student population and needs. Uh, in addition, the school's health curriculum has a very expansive uh, substance abuse disorders lesson plan in there for students in grade eight as they get to the point where they're very often uh, going to be tempted into some of that substance abuse activity. So uh, piggybacking off of the mental health interventions that were provided last school year, uh, we looked at uh, the behavior interventions that we provided. And if you see from the slide in front of you, we provided over uh, provided support over to 130 uh, traditional schools and various uh, behavior, school-wide behavior frameworks with a high emphasis on restorative practice and PBIS. Um, below on the slide, you'll see that last year we had 44 pre-K through 12 schools implementing restorative practice methods. And the reason why we say methods is because we had about 12 schools really going full-blown and taking on a whole school change in restorative practice, and other schools used uh, different uh, aspects of restorative practice as using circles effectively, using affective statements or fair process or imp in impromptu conferences. So they were using aspects of restorative practice but not a full blown. So that's why we say methods. And then we also had 79 pre-K through 12 schools utilizing PBIS. And the great news about that is out of that we had 41 schools receive recognition from the state of Maryland using it with fidelity. Um, so you can see those schools in the appendix. We did list that. And we color coded so you can see the schools who did receive what level. It's either bronze, silver, or gold uh, level. And next slide. Um, we, if you don't mind, we'd like, you wanted to finish. Oh, you want to go? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Continue. Sorry, my bad. Okay. Um, so um, we know with some schools having some level of autonomy, we know that there was other school-wide behavior frameworks that we did focus on. Um, so it wasn't just PBIS or restorative practice. We did support in, in certain areas. Um, so you'll see the list on this slide. Uh, we had School Connect, which is an SEL um, framework. We had Move This World, uh, which is uses empathetic movement. We had Holistic Life, which follows mindfulness practices. And we had Capturing Kids' Hearts, which is a combination of uh, restorative practice, and um, we had community conferencing, which has been in our district now for about, since 1999, doing formal conferencing, family conferencing, and also getting into the um, full school uh, change in restorative practice. So. Question? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify how schools were aligned to which practice. Did they self-determine what they wanted to do? Did they reach out to your office? How was that? So no, I've never understood which schools got what. Okay, so um, with PBIS, it's typically the principals reaching out to my office and asking, you know, can they be part of the PBIS? And we would go out and train them. We typically train a team of four at the school, and then we support them. With restorative practice, it was a combination of a little bit of both. So we had schools last year that were part of the um, MSDE um, priority schools that received funding there so that, that those schools received restorative practice support. We had principals reach out to us, and we also had SSLs or uh, IOEDs reach out to us and say that they would like the school to have support. So it was a combination of a little bit of both. Yeah, and I just asked the question, and I thank you for that, because I just, 
with the equity conversation, mm -hmm. we have principals who are always in the know who access mm -hmm. resources that we have at the district level. And as we think about sort of the spread of these programs and what we do, we need to be sort of conscious of the fact that some principals are savvier than others about attracting resources to their schools. I just appreciate that honest mm -hmm. description. And as we move forward, let's think about how we and we did. I had a meeting yeah. with uh, the CEO back in the summer. We mentioned about the calendar and looking at yeah. like were they just all grouped to one area geographic. Mm -hmm. And so we're working with that to try to try to handle that that situation. Thank you, Commissioner yeah. Hassan. Just to clarify, then, so this is all centrally allocated dollars, or does this also be, is something that's in? Um, some schools chose to spend their own uh, fair student funding on that. Um, like I said, MSD priority schools had funding allocated to it. Um, for, uh, central office. We put very little. We, we try to put the money into a TOT, which is um, train a trainer model, so we can build sustainability um, within that. But we put very little. It's mostly um, outside funders or uh, MSD prior dollars came to this last year. Let's keep going. We got a. Okay. a okay. We have, do you have another question? Real quick, this question from the very beginning: Have you looked at the relationship between? Um, the enrollment and also the suspension, and the difference between the fact that you have um, the enrollment in schools are, has decreased and suspension has decreased as well. Is it, it, have you looked at that relationship? Yeah, so we'll get into that in more detail with some of the um, subgroups that we talk about in future slides too. In future slides, yeah. okay. I'm a little bit yeah. ahead of you right now. Um, okay. So like this slide right here is showing that um, from 2015, 16, 2016, 17, we had declines in suspensions in every grade band in the district. Um, the largest declines were really in the middle and high school grades. And then if we go back from two years, we had um, slightly fewer suspensions than we had in the most recent year. We saw a significant decline in high school, but slight increases. Um, it's like significant increases really in all of the other grade bands. So I think if I'm not mistaken, I think the state law now prevents us from suspending pre-K to pre-K to first grade, which is kind of a pre-K to two. Well, good. That's even better because that's a baffling number. I, I, st I really still can't wrap my brain around having a pre-K kid suspended. I, I don't even know what that means. We will address that. That would be great. Good. <laughs> Tina, do you have something? Yeah, it's just like, really? Okay. Keep. Um, and in this slide, we break it out by gender. And we, uh, what we do here is it's suspension incidents per 100 students. So like this, for um, male students, they received, um, the most recent school year, they received 10.71 suspensions for every 100 students across city schools. Um, while the total number of suspensions in the district went up by about 0.3% from two years ago. Because of declining enrollment, we saw about a 3.5% increase in the rate at which our students were suspended. Um, both male and female students saw declines from 15-16 to 16-17, uh, about 18 per, around that 18% that we saw in the district as a whole, but they're both up from what we had in 2014-15. And this slide in particular, um, I want to call attention to two specific data points. In this most recent school year, we had 9.49 suspensions per 100 um, black or African American students and three per 100 for all other students in the district. Um, unfortunately, this is something that we see. Th this relative disparity has been in the past several years, probably long before that. It's something we see at the state level, something we see nationally. Another area of concern, the uh, data reflects the disproportionate uh, numbers of students with disability versus those with general education. Uh, we now have a position in the Office of uh, Special Education, uh, the Office of the Monitoring and Compliance, where we are looking very closely at the data, the practices, that office works along with suspension services, along with school support office, and along with the provision and intervention so that we are making certain that we're looking at the data and that we're putting interventions in place uh, before 
during and after the suspension, but we know that this is an area that we uh, definitely pay in close attention to as far as the disproportionality of students with disabilities. So we are aware of that and we are putting processes in place to address that particular concern. Suspension length, if you recall that identified for us and clarified for us the number of um, days for out of school time, as Ms. Hines uh, alluded to uh, in the previous slide where we talk about the short term, the long term, extended short term, out of school time only one to three days, long term, four to 10 days out of school, extended suspension 11 to 44 days out of school, and expulsion 45 days or longer. So these are the numbers as far as the number of numbers of students that have been out of school. This is the trend data for each, as we call these, the level of disciplinary response. Out of school time. Lastly, this I'm sorry. Lastly, this slide shows the top five offense codes that the students were suspended for. Um, and you can see those codes there. This is a um, three year trend data um, 405 fighting, 704, code 704 disruption, code 402 attack on student, code 401 attack on adult, and code 403 threat to adult. So again, these were the top five offense codes um, for suspension, and this is the trend data. Do, do um, attacks, I assume that uh, weapons are in, included in, no. And so, no, this particular um, offense code is just attack on a student. Okay. Um, a weapons code would be a separate, yes, that's a separate code. Times. Yes. Would you mind talking a little bit, at, at some, just briefly, about the work around the the disruption code? Because you have an asterisk there, and I just, if you if you could bring that to the attention of the board, I'd appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. So beginning in 2015-16. Um, the disruption codes, um, they included offenses that had previously been classified as inciting or participating in a disturbance. And the 2014-15, the data was reclassified for comparison purposes. So there were other offenses that were um, included. Um, Um, here we just would like to touch upon a few next steps that we are taking. So one of the next steps for at least the behavior side for the prevention in our office, office is we're excited that we are aligning it with the blueprint that we, we um, pushed out over the summer. And, um, and you can see that we, we have, uh, we're aligning it with CASEL and bringing CASEL in and we're going to have an intensive, uh, 20 intensive sites to go along with CASEL and also restore to practice. We're going to have a cohort with 15 schools. So we're definitely excited about that, lining it with the, with the blueprint and um, but also continue the great work that we, we continue to keep doing. Um, next, as we um, alluded to a little earlier, or we mentioned, we will be implementing new legislation July the 1st, um, 2017, this past summer. Legislation was um, introduced and it restricts the suspension of students in grades pre-K through two. And so guidance has been developed and written around um, 
a student who is proposed for pre-K through two so that that grade band will be greatly reduced and it's restricted um, suspensions for that grade band. However, as I stated, um, if it is a serious offense, then guidance has been established and interventions have to have been, you know, would have had to be put in place um, as well as the director of suspension or myself would have to be contacted so that the school could get further guidance um, in that. Yes, and so before they are able to, so again, they're not able to just suspend students in pre-K through two, but once that guidance has been followed and there has been um, the implementation of, you know, interventions and strategies, and if then a suspension would be warranted, then they must get a confirmation um, code and um, a, a confirmation code to say that they have permission to then suspend the child. But with that process and being implemented in place and the professional development that has been um, given to the administrators as well as the guidance document that has been distributed to all administrators, that number will greatly be reduced. I will also just say that, that the ultimate goal within Baltimore City Public Schools, and I said this in a meeting with some of my superintendent colleagues across the state um, when this legislation was being debated, um, was that the goal in Baltimore City ultimately is to actually not allow pre-K and K um, suspensions. That that is what we're working towards. That is the assumption. Um, and to the point earlier, um, it actually, <coughs> excuse me, I think is a moral statement when we are suspending um, four-year-olds um, at all. But we're working towards that. And ultimately, I understand and I know there's little nods. I'm just telling you from that there, there are many having just returned from the Council of Great City Schools. There are many of our colleagues across the nation um, who have done this in similar demographics to what we have here. So while it might not be politically correct um, or culturally correct in terms of where we are now, there are many urban school districts across the country who are proving that you do not have to suspend four and five year olds. What other jurisdictions choose to do, that's the beauty of living in the state of Maryland. They can follow that guidance. I'm just saying for here that it, it actually says something about the culture of what we believe about kids if we have to suspend four year olds. So I just want to go on record on that, be that as it may. Like I said, I've had hearty discussions with my superintendent colleagues across the state around this, fully anticipate and the staff is working very diligently to ready um, for the July date, um, but we're real clear that that is a minimal standard and it is a transition um, for Baltimore City. So I just also want to go on record and being real clear about that as well. Thank you, Dr. Santelises. Any qu questions, Commissioner Chinia and then Commissioner Frank? Just one, qu I have a question concerning the, um, the, the first of your uh, next steps and you talked about identifying schools that, were, were, that will be moving into the castle and the restorative practices. Um, to what extent have you um, aligned the identification of those schools to the suspension data? Interesting question. That's a good question. So um, what we did was is we had an application process and we um, did an intent to apply, and then we did an application process that was, um, the applications were due October 13th, I believe. I think, believe it was a week ago. And from that, I know there's task force that are uh, put together to look at all that information and to look at the schools and to review the application and to do an interview process. Um, so, but that task force, I don't know, Sean, I don't know if you could speak. Do you know when those task force could be taking place? No, I can't really speak to the task force, but I was wondering if you could try to answer the castle question, but also if you wanted to talk about your um, CEIS schools as well and looking at that data, because I mm -hmm. think that that would get to her question. Okay. So um, we have a grant. It's called the CEIS grant. It stands for Coordinated Early Intervening Services. And with that grant, we identify certain schools that have a disproportionality in suspension, and we look at those schools and we identify the students. And um, from that, we put a plan together. And this year, we were focusing on a multi-tiered system of support uh, in collaboration with uh, teaching and learning. So we could focus not only on the behavior side, but we could focus on the academics and try to link the interventions to the students, whether if the student was getting suspended because they were on a third grade reading level, but they're actually in sixth grade and they're causing a disruption or um, 
anything to get out of reading, you know, we are looking at both of that. So we're looking at a multi-tiered system of support so we could identify the appropriate interventions to look so that way if the student was a repeat, um, had uh, multiple suspensions, we could try to reduce that and get the child down to fewer suspensions or no suspensions at all. Okay, but specifically, are some of those schools also a part of this particular training? Um, we would have to go back and look to see which of those schools actually applied for this because mm -hmm. there was a level for the for the castle and the blueprint. There was a level mm -hmm. of readiness and getting your school community involved and mm -hmm. wanting to be a part of that. Okay, I ju just you know, just hoping that at some point, and, and I know you're working with the schools, but just considering. Um, there are probably schools that are repeat mm -hmm. type schools for, for you know large numbers of suspensions. So just some way of connecting, not so much that it's a choice on the part of the school, but that we may want to be really recommending that some okay. be a part of these. Uh, Ms. Jenny, and to answer your question also, in addition to that, MSDE has, has identified priority schools. Mm -hmm. So they have identified schools for us that we must target. So therefore, schools, in addition to what Mr. Bezak is, is doing, we also have a list of six schools and priority schools where we must meet those needs by putting interventions in place. So that way, we are capturing the district at, at large in terms of the whole school approach and making certain that we are moving towards a restorative, restorative district. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Frank? Is it possible to go back to slide nine? Well, I haven't finished slide 13. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought the next, I apologize. I'll wait. Okay, and, and then the, the very last board, when we talk about the, the monitoring piece, we're very pleased that we work very closely with the technology department because we have put in various infrastructures in terms of infinite campus, and we're very pleased with that, whereas we're able to look at the data review, data cleansing. Uh, we can target schools. Uh, we're able to then, uh, under the CAO, where we now have Letters of concern when schools are, are doing well with their data that we have concerns about. We now have the three prong with the guidance, support, and accountability. Uh, we have focused professional development training, which is a which has been a big plus to make certain that we have the PD that is also district wide and also site based. So we're very pleased that we have a system in place to be able to be able to track and monitor the data so that when we able to generate our reports, we can then uh, be able to disaggregate the data, and we are very pleased that we have our technology that will allow us to do just that. Okay. So, Commissioner Frank? Slide nine, is that possible? I just um, have a question, either among board members or the panel. Are there any inferences that you've drawn from this data in terms of the differences um, suspension by race and ethnicity, and also, secondly, have you broken this down by income? I'm curious, is it possible to break down by poverty levels um, as well as race and ethnicity? We have not. Okay. The, 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 the thing we could potentially do, and one complication is because of how we've changed how we've calculated over the past several years, is looking at, like, farms and direct certification data. Mm -hmm. Um, and how that shakes out. Um, one reason why it wasn't included was because uh, from 14, 15 through 16, 17, as we've transitioned to be directly certified, that underlying data has changed in a lot of fundamental ways. Mm -hmm. And so we were really concerned about um, how to clearly show the real data and not right. the fact that we're feeding all of our kids. In terms of the data itself, I'm curious, is there a policy response to this? Are there inferences we draw from the differences here? What is the response to this information that we received about the differences broken down by ethnicity and race? Is it disparate treatment? Is it, do we have any sense of whether suspensions are being apply, applied fairly across the board? I'm curious if any of that has been thought about with respect to the data here. Perhaps that's something that we can consider, however, when we use, when we submit the data points to MSDE, these are the categories that they ask for, just the numbers without a deep dive into clarification, but certainly we can take that information and then do what we need to do within city schools to be able to then look at that very closely the way that you have, have recommended. Since you invited either the, the board or the panel, I, I'm, I'm thinking this is part of what's driving the creation of the whole child office and looking at this through an equity lens because one can probably infer that there's a disproportionate 
application of suspension rule. I mean, so I, we have I, to provide better supports for, for our children to get out this data, but they're, these, tr these consistent bless you. Bless you, overrepresentation of young African American boys is. I think one of the things that happened right here tonight is what I wanted to happen is I was watching the board and like there's a there's a reaction to this and that's what I wanted to happen. I wanted the people to start to name this because working with MSDE and working with some of our schools which will remain nameless when we talk about the disproportionate amount of sus number of suspensions for African Americans it's a, been a frequent response has been well a whole district is African American so that's irrelevant. That's not true when 90 some percent of our students that are being suspended are African American but only 80 percent of the population is. So I want to first name it and that's why that last slide I, we've called out specifically uh, disproportionate number of suspensions and I, I said earlier about students with disabilities but this is another one right here around race and then gender with as well so I feel like my team this year and now that we have a we actually have a team a full team that we want to really do an analysis into what are the root causes what's happening here and then set up those systems of supports around that but whole child is a, I think another piece has been really just helping us name this and call this out and could I add, I mean, I, I would also add that you combine two of those that you just said, the African-American males as well as the special needs, because I think that you're going to find some overlapping in terms of either folks who have been misdiagnosed and placed in those programs, and I'm sure they're coming out of the least uh, restrictive environments. Yeah, and then that will touch into the special education data around referral and eligibility and pieces like that as well. I covered? Um, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. Kids. That's a whole other yeah, there's a whole yes. that's another category. Yes, Mr. Hart, yes. I agree with Mr. Hart. I second yeah, that emotion right there. Good point. Um, um, Commissioner so Hart I appreciate the transparency. I know this is this is hard to talk about, but I just this is an example of the kind of information we need to share with the public and be honest about it so we can have these conversations and move forward. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, but I would say on so we know these we've heard interventions, we heard mental health, we heard the climate of how do we know that these strategies are working? Do we have data that's attached to, are there, is there a reduction in suspensions because of these interventions we put forward? Do we have that data? It's not in the presentation. I just want to say, do we have it, number one. Number two, for the public, like we know suspensions is one thing, but that doesn't tell us that kids are still feeling safe in schools, right? So I think we need to look at this data coupled with our climate survey data and whatever else we have available to us to know are students now feeling safer because we have these great interventions that Mr. Banzak talked about or the mental health programs Ms. Fink talked about. Like, we need to have a whole bigger picture here, so I appreciate this presentation in and of itself, but to, in order for us to sort of have that conversation, Mr. Conley and Dr. Conley, move forward, how do we know what we're doing well and what we're not doing well, what we need to change, what we need to add, or whatever. So I just yeah. want to add that. So um, thank you. I think, uh, again, I'm only in week two, but, but I am happy that we've had this conversation about the data and the work that needs to be done several times since I got here a week ago. Um, and I can assure you that I, you know, the answer to the question is um, we have a problem, you know, when we see, when we see this data. Um, we know we've made some good strides in the past year, and now we need to understand exactly, we need to get down into that data and understand better exactly which things are working and why, um, and which things may be not working quite as well. Um, we aren't at the point yet where we've done sort of a, a rigorous academic research study to understand the causation between some of the interventions and the, you know, the results here. But, but we were going to keep digging into the data um, and, uh, and, you know, I think really deepening our own analysis and understanding of how we, how we get better at this. Commissioner Cooper? You did not have a question? Um, I just want to uh, ditto um, Commissioner High Cupboard. I'm, I'm looking forward to sort of when we come back one year later, you know, after we've put some of these things in place, that um, you'll have the data, but I'd, I'd also be interested in a couple of case studies where, you know, a before and after picture, you know, some suspension data, the demographics, including homeless and as much as we can say about income race. Um, the, the, what was going on there, we put in place some restorative practice, we built on our mental health, just could sort of create a picture for us of, of what was going on and therefore as a result. I'm not suggesting we can uh, 
draw grand conclusions from a couple of case studies, but we have to sort of make this real. And I would also argue that when that presentation is made, hearing from a couple of students who exist, who were, were going to a school where things weren't working so well and, and either they opted in to these, some of these targeted schools through the whole child program or they were invited in because of their data. We're gonna, we want to, we have to make this a, a more real thing for people because the numbers can be shocking enough, but I, I, I want to see how it all adds up in some places and I, I, I want to, I'm really, um, I would love to hear from a young person about how, if any of this feels different to them. Yeah, I want to see the climate survey, but I really want to hear the voice of a kid telling me how this feels to them. Because um, I, we all know inherently that, you know, they're telling us something. When they're acting out and doing it, they're telling us something. And so like, we're taking our best shots at it, but we got to paint a picture that helps us all understand what's, what's really going on before and after. So, final thoughts? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. That concludes our um, presentations. Uh, we have um, eight upcoming meetings. Uh, I'll do these in chronological order. The PTA Council of Baltimore City will meet in this room on October tomorrow at 6:30. CCAC will meet in this room on November 13th at 6. The next board executive session will meet upstairs at 3 on November 14th. The next public board meeting will meet in this room at 5 on the 14th. PCAB's uh, next official public meeting is Thursday, November 16th at 6.30. Uh, Trish suggested you go to their website for some additional special meetings. Um, the Ops Committee will meet here on Tuesday, November 21st at 10. Policy Committee will meet on Tuesday, November 21st at 3.30. And last but not least, Teaching and Learning on November 28th at 9 in this room. Anything else for the good of the whole? With that, we are, do I have to take a vote? Gee. I have a motion to close the meeting. So moved, so moved by Commissioner High Cupboard. Second. second no. Commissioner Bondima. No, let's stay. No. <laughs> All in favor of concluding the meeting, aye. I, I approve of closing the meeting. <laughs>